Okay, now I want you to do your best. Get me that car, Herbie Villain Yell. Oh, golly, I can't outdo what's been done already. Well, put your own spin on it. Fred Tomlinson and... and, and John Vernon. Ke- and Ke- Keenan Wynn and... Yeah. Oh, golly, Even Harvey know. Corman to some extent, but like, give it a try. Get me that car! Well, all right. Get me that car! Well, now, now you're you're going a little too far. Now you're like in Skeletor territory. How, how is that too far? It's Herbie the Love Bug. You I, can't go too far. I suppose you're right. <laughs> Greetings, friends. Welcome back to Critically Acclaimed, the podcast where highbrow and lowbrow collide. Oh, not again! <laughs> okay. Collide! Ah! Can I do it once more? No, no, I think we're done. No, I think we're good. My name is Whitney Sutton. Collide! Ah! Why am I doing it? <laughs> My face! You jerk. My name is Whitney Seibold. I'm a film critic of some stripe. Uh, I don't have a nickname, but uh, I do write for the internet, and I do have a co-host who is uh, dazzling and intelligent, and huh? uh, he's going to introduce himself now. Oh, I, I look forward to meeting this person. That's you, silly. Oh, you're nice. Hey, everybody. My name is William Bibiani. I'm a film critic for places like mm-hmm. IGN and The Rap, and uh, everybody calls me Bibs. Mm-hmm. And we got a doozy for you this week, Huge friends. Huge episode. Uh, because not only will we be reviewing uh, five new films this Oh, week. more than five. Oh, more we than we five. Have, we have Annihilation, Game mm-hmm. Night, Every Day, The Cured, Mute, and The Young Karl Marx. So six Six new films this week. A lot, a lot of films. Uh, but in addition to those six new films, I'm sure you're all eager to hear what we think of the young Karl Marx. Uh, we'll also be laying out bare in front of the world our predictions for this year's Academy Awards. And we'll talk about who we think should win, but what we're doing right now is we're predicting who we think will win for better or worse. And every year, Whitney and I have an Oscar wager Mm -hmm. to see who can predict the most categories accurately. Uh, You have historically been better at this, although I have won in a a few years. You've won a few times. Mm -hmm. It is pretty, pretty close. And this is a weird year, and we'll talk about that when we get to Mm -hmm. that segment. Uh, But the loser of that particular wager has to do a free downloadable commentary track for the film they declared the worst movie of 2017. Oh, it's going to be rough. Remind everyone what your pick was? My number one was The Book of Henry. That's a bad movie. Oh, it's, oh, it's quite bad. It's very, very bad. Mm-hmm. So, well, like, uh, like it beat out the emoji movie. It's it's bad. So if you like the part in our podcast where we talk about the bad movie and how bad it is, we will do that for the total running time of If Whitney Loses, The Book of Henry, mm-hmm. and If I Lose, Transformers, The Last Night, God help us, that movie is like eight hours long. It's not as long as Transformers Age of Extinction, but I think it only beats it out by like maybe five minutes or yeah, something. Yeah, and bear in mind, like mm. like eight hours of that eight hours is like the credits, and then the <laughs> other eight hours of that eight hours is the movie. So we'll see. But in any case, that would be available for free download on uh, the Schmozno iTunes feed, or you can listen to it uh, on the SK Plus Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, YouTube channel. Uh, You won't be watching the movie with us. Uh, We'll help you sync it up as you watch it at home on whatever streaming service, Uh, home video release of your choice. But uh, when we do commentary tracks, it's not necessary that you necessarily watch the movie. No, Uh, we're going to talk about while we talk about. We're going to talk about huge spoilers in that case. So, Mm -hmm. like, it'd probably help if you'd seen the movie or if you never care to see the movie. But yeah, you can listen to it as a long commentary track about just how why we think that's a bad movie. Um, So that that's what we'll go on later in the show. Both of those films uh, were in both of our bottom ten lists, so we're we're both pretty down on either of those. We're not we, whatever fans. whatever we get to, and then uh, and then uh, lastly, we're going to be reviewing every single film in the Herbie the Love Bug series as requested by our Schmoville Facebook page mm-hmm. fans. So uh, buckle up, everybody! It's going to be a bumpy podcast. It's just going to be a long podcast. It's be long. We, that's what we do. But it is what we do. It's what we do. And we're we're committed. We're strapped in. We're caffeinated. I have tea. Thank you. Let's get started. The Badgers are all dead. Let's go. What should we start with? What's the biggest release Mm. of the week? The biggest new release? Biggest new release of the week. People probably want to hear us talk about Annihilation. So let's talk about Annihilation. What is Annihilation? Annihilation, from the director of Ex Machina, uh, is a mysterious science fiction movie about a group of scientists who have to invade an area called that they have nicknamed the Shimmer. Uh, a, a meteor has landed on a lighthouse in this little coastal area with not a lot of people around. The people, 
People have been evacuated, wow. and it is slowly growing, and it's been growing for months. Holy cow. Um, a year, actually, because uh, like, we find out, because uh, it stars Natalie Portman as mm. a scientist, and her husband, played by Oscar Isaac, mm. went into the Shimmer a year ago and disappeared. Oh, right. So it's been well, around for a little while. So yeah, she... she uh, is called in to investigate when her husband, who has been missing for a year, reappears, but he is mysteriously ill and nobody can figure out why. And he doesn't seem to have any memories as to what happened while he was in The Shimmer. So she teams up with a bunch of other scientists, uh, led by Jennifer Jason Lee and um, Tessa Thompson from Thor Ragnarok is in there as well. And they all go in with guns, and as soon as they enter, everything's strange. It's quite uh, they, uh, strange. They can't remember the first three days when they were in there, for instance. <sighs> They just sort of wake up, and three days have passed, and what? they don't know what happened, and they start looking around, and there's these really kind of, like, brightly Toys R Us colored fungus that are growing on everything, and they find that plants are growing their own, like, several species are growing out of well, the same plant. I, I, I don't want to ruin Annihilation mm. for anybody, because a lot of the, I think, a lot of the pleasure you're going to get from this movie... Mm. It's kind of watching it unfold. Unfolding, yeah. what, what I will say is that it's it's about, you know, they go inside of this shimmer, this place, mm-hmm. this this area where a meteorite hit, and they find out that some sort of alien entity, mm-hmm. virus, meteorite, monster, fungus, whatever, has been just sort of growing and ru- letting mm-hmm. all of biology around it run amok. Right. And it leads to some really interesting imagery, a couple of very exciting set pieces, some really, really scary bits. Mm-hmm. Um this is a movie, again, it's from Alex Garland, who did Ex Machina, which uh, is a film that I think it, there's some fair criticisms lobbed at it, but it's a very thoughtful piece of science fiction. Mm-hmm. This is him kind of taking that kind of thoughtful approach to a sci-fi concept he had in Ex Machina, but putting it in a context where it kind of has to be a bit more forthrightly action-heavy. Mm-hmm. Action heavy for Alex Garland, well, not um, for anyone else. I was going to say there's, what, there's guns, there's monsters, there's there's, uh, there's paranoia, there's the, the threat of maybe the world to get taken over. It it's a bigger scale. There's there's guns and monsters and what have you. There may be a bigger scale, but this is a, a film that is very much interested in the thought process. It's interested in the mood more than and than the action. There, yeah, there are guns and yeah, there are like some violent scenes, but they're meant to sort of repel you. The guns are incidental. These are not. Uh, women of action they're not you know badass well, action stars very distinctly natalie portman's the only person on the team who has had any military training yeah yeah that's and it's not that the other ones have been like trained trained to shoot guns but they're not all military types yeah this isn't predator mm. where they're all just right, right. macho jerks with guns um so it, it ends up being about something, and they actually say this in dialogue about something Freud talked about, about self annihilation. Mm. And uh, it kind of examines a lot of the, the processes and the the workings of how that works in the human mind about uh, why we if, if you're unclear mm. i'm just gonna give you the basic gist mm. of it um you would think biologically everything we do would be for our own survival but in actuality every human being tends to do something mm. that actively works to destroy ourselves mm. that could be addictive behaviors like alcoholism mm. or smoking cigarettes or that could be more you know dangerous sorts of behavior yeah, where uh, you put yourself at risk to feel alive that it, kind of thing it, that's it's, self-annihilation it's what, it, it's what Freud called the death drive. Yeah. Everybody is possessed of the death drive. Um, and I appreciate his thoughtfulness. I really, really loved Ex Machina in that, you know, sort of used a science fiction con- conceit to explore misogyny. Um, this one is using these scientists to sort of explore self-destructive behavior. Um, it could have used maybe a half teaspoon of schlock. That's my thing with this. It's, that's it's my, almost, that's... almost a little too thoughtful for its own good. And I appreciate a good, slow-moving, thoughtful science fiction movie. Don't oh, get yeah. me wrong. And like films like uh, Solaris in mm. 2001 and Stalker, like their influence is all over this. Mm. But what, you know what other... Stalker inf- especially. But yeah. you know what other influences is all over this? Alien. Mm. Predator, like a lot of. I've, I think uh, I've seen a hundred sci- like ch- really cheap B sci fi movies about sort of people tre- with trekking, guns in the people with guns trekking into some sort of dangerous monster ridden territory. And, and that's my thing. Like I feel like this is kind of a pastiche of a lot of different elements. Whereas Ex mm. Machina felt rather distinctive in comparison. So 
what I'm looking at here is, okay, here's this scene. The way Alex Garland doing it is very interesting. But I've already seen that scene in The Thing. Yeah. So I'm constantly kind of aware of the of the precedence for all of these uh, big moments. And I feel like as I'm watching this movie, I wish I could go back and watch this movie when I was 16. <laughs> and I had, like, had my mind blown by all the things that clearly blew Alex Garland's mind mm. that he is currently evoking cinematic. I'm not sure if if it is pasty. I, he did write it, but I'm not it's sure based if on he's, a, it's based on a book. But well. yeah, it's based on a book, so I'm not sure if he's really trying to evoke something like the thing. I it think, might be subconscious, but yeah, it's there. I th- there's I a, think a lot of scene with all the chairs isn't from the thing. I think all of the. Uh, all of the, the tropes that we recognize don't necessarily come from the specific... Like, it doesn't come from the, the thing. It comes from the first version of the thing. It comes from, like, a dozen other science fiction movies. Yeah. I think it's he's repeating a lot that's just sort of endemic to the, the, the genre. And that makes audiences kind of expect a certain kind of tone. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, I feel like in not embracing a little bit more of his his very own exploitation elements, mm-hmm. he's doing his own film at least a, a tonal disservice. Yeah, um, which is not to say that he's undercutting his thought at all. The thought is first and foremost on his mind, and the climax is amazing and has a lot of scary visuals and stuff. There's there's, there's something in the climax mm-hmm. that I don't think I've seen in a movie before, and it's yeah. it's really creepy. Um, yeah, I, I I would never write this movie up. I think it's too interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's it's some of the things that it showed me I hadn't quite seen before but it is playing on it's trying to play on two different levels it is trying to be in some respects a science fiction thriller Mm -hmm. and on that level I think it falls a little flat yeah as a thoughtful science fiction film it's there but I still don't feel like maybe it's I feel like it's more evoking the mood of thoughtful science fiction thrillers than it is actually being all that thoughtful Mm. all the time a lot of the conclusions that people come to are just sort of intimate and personal and aren't actually necessarily relating to me on a personal level Mm. I will say this Ex Machina is a film that grew on me over time the more I thought about it the more I realized Uh there were different layers so uh, when it comes to Annihilation I reserve the right as I do with anything to change my (laughs) mind later on when I oh wait I wasn't looking at it through the right lens or oh Mm. uh, actually this works even less well than I thought these things happen Mm. Um, but I watched Annihilation and I thought to myself this is a very assured uh, uh, interestingly stylistic uh unusual science fiction film that feels like it has been assembled like a Frankenstein monster from other science fiction films I enjoyed. Mm. So as a result, it just doesn't feel that fresh and exciting to me. But it's not bad. I would not tell anyone to to avoid seeing it. You can tell that uh, Alex Garland is trying really hard to just sort of wow you with uh, just his imagery. And there are some very striking images. Gorgeous. Um, I think... Gorgeous and creepy. But as as I said, it, it could have been maybe a little schlockier. We could yeah. have seen um, more screams, more B-movie style agony. Well, uh, you- just, just something a little bit slightly... I, I rarely ever call for this sort of thing, but <laughs> slightly more sensational. Well, again, we, the just, idea slightly, of- just slightly, just well, slightly, like the- uh, modulate that mood a little bit more toward something that's a little more familiar and fun. And I think you have a stronger film. Well, I think there's, I think you got to remember that mm. a motion picture is the way a motion picture functions is unless you turn it off and, and leave and give up on it, mm. you're sitting there, you're sitting with it for an, a distinct amount of time. Mm. And it is the movie's job to keep your attention that entire time. And with <laughs> a contemplative film, you do run the risk of losing the audience and you have to be careful about that. Yeah. With a film like Annihilation, where parts of it have monsters and guns and mm. crazy sci-fi stuff, and a lot of the rest of it is just standing in a leafy glade, mildly debating Freud, like not even like really <laughs> Intensely, like it's you're gonna run the risk mm. of maybe losing us or getting us interested in the stuff that the filmmaker yeah. is less interested in. I think that's a valid critique. I don't think it sinks the film, but I do think you're right. I do think it maybe, it, maybe it has pacing problems, yeah. and I think that's a fair critique. Yeah. Um, I guess there's two ways you could have done it. You could have added a little bit more sort of a- actiony bits and made it feel a little bit more like a a film the audience would be used to, which. Again, I, I usually try to advocate for something new and something exciting. So there is another way to push this in the opposite direction. We take away and, all the action and don't make us expect it. Yeah, there's no action. Maybe there are some monsters, but they're so unfamiliar that you know a gun wouldn't take down that thing. It's got a and Lovecraftian it starts, kind of vibe. Yeah, to yeah, it, and, really. and, yeah. It, and it, if you kind of scale it back into something like 
I don't know, beyond the black rainbow or something. It's just like all, That's, all head and all strange. I'm not a big that, fan of beyond the black rainbow, I love but beyond I, the black I rainbow. know <laughs> I find it, I find it willfully obtuse. Like I, it's too, I far, know. it's too far in the other direction. Okay. Oh my God. <laughs> all right my wife michelle is so disappointed in me right now she came in from another room because i said i didn't care for beyond the black rainbow she's okay i, okay. I i'm okay, sorry so. <laughs> here's my problem with beyond the black so, rainbow i will tell you so, this right now so you willie, willie the was rainbow? being shamed I'm gonna say, and this uh, is now my, he's on the very right side of history uh-huh. this is very distinctly my problem with the movie beyond the black rainbow which i know is a lot of cool fans can't we There's, just can't, there, can't we get Beyond the Black Rainbow. <laughs> yes, that's my other problem with it. My biggest problem with it has nothing to do with like the plot or anything like that. Mm-hmm. The movie has a consistent room tone, which is like putting like a vacuum cleaner on, like to get a baby to sleep. I always just, <laughs> I kind of zone out because it's got this room tone yeah, that is yeah, just yeah. loud enough that I zone out. Kind of grinding it's a weird machine thing. noise in the background. It's, it's probably a good movie. I can't get into it because it puts me off with its room tone. There, I said it. I'm not proud of it <laughs> <laughs> let's move on okay now uh, the next major release this weekend uh-huh is a film called game night a movie which doesn't have a lot of room tone um well i guess it does it's not very loud and i didn't notice i digress <laughs> this isn't going to be the new room tone podcast uh cool. game night welcome to room tone on kcrw <laughs> <Shut> <laughs> Game, Game Night. Game Night is a comedy film. Game Night stars uh, Jason Bateman and Rachel McAdams mm-hmm. as an incredibly competitive married couple who every week host their own Game Night, mm-hmm. along with their best friends and most decidedly not their creepy next-door neighbor, a cop played by Jesse Plemons from mm-hmm. Breaking Bad. Uh, and he, the, the cop next door, they were good friends with he and his wife, but he and his wife recently divorced. He's mm-hmm. now living alone with his dog. In the big and house next door and his memories, he never takes off his cop uniform, and he wants to go back to game night. And and Jason Bateman and Rachel McAdams come up with lame, sputtering excuses not to welcome him in. Yep. Uh, this will come into play later. It's all important later. Uh, it's actually, okay, it's actually a very well-structured uh, screenplay. Um, so it, it, uh, reminded, out, it reminded me of The Man Who Knew Too Little. I like that movie yeah. a lot, actually. I think that movie's <laughs> funny. Uh, there's actually a whole long history of this particular genre, but the genre uh, uh, begins thusly in Game Night. Uh, Kyle Chandler has an older brother... Uh, Jason Bateman has an older brother. (laughs) Shut up. I'm so lost now. You guys got me so messed up on room tone. (laughs) Just thinking about it gets your mind in a haze. Yeah. Anyway, so Jason, Jason Bateman, Bateman has a brother played by Kyle Chandler. Kyle Chandler is infinitely more successful and popular than Jason Bateman. Mm-hmm. He's very competitive with his brother. His brother puts on his own game night, and it's going to be one of those like role playing mystery games mm-hmm. where he tells everyone make your own mystery. He tells everyone at some point tonight, I am going to be kidnapped, and you will have to find me. Mm-hmm. And whoever finds me wins my car. And then Kyle is, Chandler yeah. is kidnapped by actual kidnappers, not the role playing team he hired for the thing. Yeah. And no one knows it's not fake, so they're pursuing these kidnappers, uh, not realizing that their lives are in mortal peril. Mm-hmm. It's the the game is real genre, and it's actually really, really kind of an old genre going mm-hmm. back to like the most dangerous game. But it's everything from The Man Who Knew Too Little with Bill Murray, which as I said mm-hmm. is very, very funny, um, to a fun film called Tag the Assassination Game with a young Linda <laughs> Hamilton. No one remembers that one, but it's pretty neat. And worth checking out uh the last starfighter and tron oh, are versions go. of this jumanji mm-hmm. is a version of this mm-hmm. um and uh yeah this is a very well crafted version of that because the cast is great mm. the characters are distinctive and funny and the directors the guys who also directed the very bad <laughs> sequel vacation like the, the most yeah. recent one uh which i just did not find funny at all that's a terrible movie is they directed the hell out of this movie it looks like a david they, fincher film and the movie's filmmaking takes it so seriously that whenever wacky stuff mm-hmm. happens it just becomes that much more funny the, because of the juxtaposition they're actually better at sort of the action and the tension than they are at the comedy in fact a lot of the comedy is uh, that really annoying comedy of awkwardness where someone's mm-hmm. put in an awkward position and the camera just points at them while they kind of sputter and backtrack and try to get themselves out. That just makes me feel uncomfortable. I don't like watching that in comedies I, I generally. Think, I think when you add uh, the, and if they don't get out of the situation, they mm-hmm. will be killed. It adds another layer of suspense and I, interest. I suppose so. Um, you mentioned that the cast is great. 
Rachel McAdams oh is the star of this movie. She's so good. Um, she was in Mean Girls, and everybody thought she was, you know, going to be this new sort of voice in comedy. And she ended up doing, you know, more romances, more family films. She's a fine actress. I'm don't get dramas me wrong. as well. And Spotlight. Dramas, yeah. and, uh, she, she had a very varied career. She yeah. didn't become the comedian star. She, she did get, yeah, a chance to become a movie star, and good for her. But yeah, she never became sort of the the comedy star that we thought she was going to be, and. Uh, here we're reminded. Wait a minute. She actually is like one of the funniest actresses working. Yeah. Um, she uh, approaches everything with this sort of flip, dismissive attitude. There's a hilarious scene where she has to dig a bullet out of her husband's mm. arm that goes on and on and on. Oh my on. god, that scene should not be funny. That scene should be gross or uh. painful. And the way like Jason Bateman and Rachel McAdams play off of each other mm. as they try to as they try to perform like alleyway surgery on a bullet wound, just checking it on Google and like she's got blood. All over her hands, and she's using her nose to, 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 like, yeah, put, to touch the phone, so she knows how to remove a bullet from the. Uh, it was from a white supremacist website she had found. Oh my god! <laughs> you remember that? I forgot it's about like, that. It was, it was the only one I could find. I just, I'll, and she even said, "I'll just ignore all the Nazi stuff." <laughs> Yeah, there's so many, like, it, it, it's hard to describe how good Game Night is without mm. sort of re- reminding ourselves of kind of like the bad state of motion picture broad comedy right now. Mm. Because a lot of motion picture broad comedy right now kind of got trapped in that Judd Apatow school where the plotting is very loose mm. and every, like, comedic scene is usually sort of designed in such a way that, yeah, yeah, designed in such a way that the actors can do like 60 riffs on the same joke and then they use. 30 of them. Yeah. And then you put all they put the other 30 mm. in every scene in the credits. And it's like that's kind of funny, but the problem is that if you actually have a plot that's interesting. Like you can do that in, in a movie with almost no plot, like knocked up. Mm. But like in a movie where the plot is actually like kind of engaging, like well, Game Night or Spy, we want to you to move on yeah, because yeah, yeah. we're invested the, in what's uh, happening. The, the biggest offender of this in recent memory, I think, was the the Ghostbusters remake. Mm. It's like you have a Ghostbusters film. It's like this big special effects bonanza. It's about yeah. catching ghosts, and the characters wouldn't shut up. They were just chattering in every single scene. And that's not the fault of any and, of the actors. All the actors in that movie no, are great. They, they, it's just they the, were directed the, that way. Yeah. They were told just start, just chatter, say things. You know, say you're really nervous. There's like, so many things I actually it's okay really like have, about that movie. I, there's a lot of things I really like about that movie. But yeah, the pacing it, it is never, the problem. It, it never had a, a chance to really build any sort of tension or mood or anything because people are just talking the whole time. Yeah, Game Night, on the other hand, is tightly scripted. Yeah. It was written by people who are funnier <laughs> than an improv actor. And when improv can be really, really great, but it's fun but it's because it's extemporaneous. Mm-hmm. When you're writing something and you're carefully crafting it, you're building gags yeah. over the course of the film, and they blow up and balloon and go in unexpected directions, and it is so much more dynamic most of the time. Game Night is just really just well structured. I don't want to ruin it for you. I don't want to tell you everything that happens in this movie. It just goes off. Like I, there's a couple of times in the movie where I literally just turn to the person next to me and it's like, "And here's what's going to happen." Because in most movies, this is what would happen. Game Night didn't do that. Game Night went in a completely different direction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know, and, and it all makes sense in retrospect. I mean, it's a, it's kind of obviously the premise is ridiculous. But like you, within its own logic, I, it makes sense. I, I don't want to oversell how how tightly scripted it is. However, because it's mm. it's it does it does suffer from a few loose moments where the the actors are just sort of allowed to to ramble for a bit, mm. and it's only when it gets sort of down to the characters in a tense moment that it actually starts to f- shine. Um, there's a really great uh, moment about a, a couple who might be on the outs because of an event of potential infidelity and I don't want to reveal any of the details of that's that that's a great because, subplot because it's a great subplot and it did and not go ha- anywhere I thought it would go and, and it has a great reveal um, yeah. and around that scene there's a bit where they have to uh, steal something from a mansion and again I don't want to say anything but yeah. they have an object that they have to pass between them like a game of keep away yeah, yeah. like a game of keep away and it was one of those, like an atomic blonde, one of those one-shot uh, marvels that you know goes up and down floors, and we're following this object that they're flying, flying around. It's virtuoso it's, filmmaking, and you can tell that they didn't use a lot of cheats to like hide edits. Though you could t- see the actors getting tired. Yeah, you could see that you know these people are not all you know virtuoso fighters. They're just sort of leaping about awkwardly as human beings would. No, like imagine, imagine like the fight scene from like the end of Atomic Blonde that everyone talks about. Or- or uh-huh. any of the other like really long one take completely crazy action sequences you've ever seen. Now imagine that with like 
three times as many characters, and they all have to be funny. (laughs) While they're doing it. And it has to be suspenseful at the same time. Mm. That is hard, and they (laughs) nailed it. That's impressive filmmaking. Again, these guys made Vacation. That's not a good movie. I didn't know they had this in them. Think, this is really great. I think their future is is action and thrillers. Well, they're oh. actually they're tapped to direct the movie version of The Flash. So, sounds like a good pairing. Yeah, honestly, and they they and I, and I hate uh, Vacation. <laughs> and I they, really hate Vacation. They co-wrote Spider Man Homecoming, which was pretty good. It was pretty good. I, I liked it. I have issues with it, but it's mostly quite good. Mostly quite good. It's, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. So cool. No, but so like, yeah, game night. Quite a winner. <laughs> Who knew? Uh, tell me about because you actually saw more movies than I did. All right. Tell me about a movie. Uh, tell me about Mute, Mute. which is on, oh, yeah. Netflix on Netflix now from Duncan Jones. This is from Duncan Jones, who uh, previously directed Moon, mm-hmm. Big Indie Darling, and then yeah. he did Source Code, which was critically acclaimed. Was but it? I, mean, I thought I was kind lot, of in the minority. Lot, I love of, that movie. A lot actually. of critics really liked it, although it wasn't a huge hit. Uh, I wasn't the biggest fan. Yeah. Time travel stories don't stand up to much scrutiny, do they? I think Source um, Code works pretty well, but yeah. okay. Um, and then he did Warcraft, and which then he did, I liked. And then he did Warcraft. I don't understand why everyone's so down on Warcraft. I've seen <laughs> so many worse sucks. fantasy films. <laughs> like, it's not it's not a classic epic by any stretch of the imagination, but I've seen so many worse fantasy films no. than Warcraft that people gave a pass to. I do not understand why Warcraft got, got all this negative attention. It's think, really not that bad a movie. I think because it's, like, as bad as those ones people gave a pass to, but it is visually not nearly as interesting and because they use like so many special effects it becomes like busy and ugly and difficult and it's so long that it just becomes a chore right, to I'm watch not, I, we're I, not having this conversation i do not right like warcraft, i like but, warcraft quite a bit uh, now he's made uh, another big budget science fiction movie but it went straight to netflix um I don't know the politics behind it. I don't know why it was. He's been trying to, to get it made for a really long mm-hmm. time, actually. I remember I interviewed him right after Source Code came out, and he was talking about how he was trying to get Mute off the ground. Mm-hmm. Never happened. <laughs> Just kept trying. Never yeah. happened. Netflix came along, and they managed to make it work. Mm-hmm. So what is Mute? So Mute is a sci-fi noir film. Uh, it takes place in the... I guess the near future, but it feels like the distant future. Everything's really overstuffed. T- tech is everywhere uh, of England. Alexander Skarsgård plays an ex-Amish man who suffered an accident when he was a boy and hasn't been able to speak his whole life. That's an interesting setup. Yeah. Okay. Um, the fact that he is mute has very, very little to do with the actual plot. It's just sort of window dressing. Hmm. In fact, this whole movie... Is window dressing. Oh, no. Um, so he gets involved, embroiled in, a, he plays a bartender in this futuristic strip club where there's strippers, but also robot strippers. And uh, he is beloved and beloves uh, one of the waitresses there, a, a pretty femme fatale with blue hair, and she goes missing. Mm. And so it's up to him to sort of trek into the sci fi noir underworld to find out who she is. Simply by, like, holding up pictures and giving threatening looks because he can't speak. (laughs) Okay. His story starts to diminish as this film goes on, and it's two hours and five minutes long, uh, in favor of Paul Rudd and Justin Theroux, who play surgeon torturers of an unseen futuristic crime boss guy. And, okay. And Paul Rudd is kind of a hardworking dad. He has a young daughter. The mother's out of the picture. He's trying to make ends meet for her. He's trying to get his papers so he can leave England. Evidently, his papers are just gone. So he's constantly petitioning a forger to make papers for him. Okay. And to make ends meet, uh, they like put stoolies on an operating table and he essentially tortures them to death or just until he gets the information they want. It's pretty, okay. It's Justin Theroux takes a little too much glee in the torture, and he also has some other sexual proclivities that get into him into a lot of trouble. And there's a lot of scenes of Paul Rudd and Justin Theroux having discussions about what empty monsters they've become. Okay. Those scenes would be kind of interesting if it took place in the modern day, and there was no Alexander Skarsgård plot, and it was directed by, say, uh... Some notable indie director, Snow Angels, Duncan Jones. Well, well, I guess Duncan. Well, I guess Duncan Jones isn't an indie director anymore. He I only did. Not. He only did one, and now he's done three like big budget sci fi movies. Fine. <laughs> 
So, but like, okay, but, so, so, so it sounds like it's unfocused it's, and like the it's protagonist isn't very goes interesting. On, the protagonist isn't very interesting. The story isn't very interesting. And I don't know why it needed to be set in the future. I don't know what the technology has to do with anything. I don't know what his being mute has to do with anything. There's no central theme or idea behind this. It's just a lot of really cool visuals, a really kind of fully realized world without really a story set in it. And you can tell Duncan Jones is really thrilled by his own production design. There's a lot of voice-activated vending machines everywhere, and people can just sort of touch the walls around them. I'm imagining this right now. This is the pitch. Like, I got this thing. It's a noir story. vending machines everywhere. Yeah, it's a noir story. The protagonist isn't very interesting. We're going to get sidetracked by the tortures, but I digress. The important thing is vending machines everywhere! (laughs) There's vending machines. There's tall buildings. There's one really cool shot where we see a bunch of people bowling in a futuristic bowling alley, and we pull out, and we pull down, it turns out that's the second floor of this futuristic bowling alley, and there's bowling underneath and we pull out even further, and it turns out there's bowling alleys everywhere. It was actually a really cool shot. It's a cool setting. It's all very unique looking. Mm-hmm. And it's all very striking. It has no mood or tone or direction or interesting plot at all. I wonder if, and, 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 and this is coming from someone who, again, likes Warcraft. Mm. Like, it's, I don't think it's a classic. I don't think it's great. I, yeah. I just like it. I think it's a fun science fiction. Um, mm. fa- I think it's a fun fantasy film. I don't know why I can't talk today. <laughs> It occurs to me that Duncan Jones might be one of those filmmakers who is better the less money you give them. He Maybe might, so. He might get a little if, if wrapped Moon, up in Moon the technology and the style. Moon is his most interesting film. And even Source Code isn't that elaborate, all things considered. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a mid-range sci-fi thriller. Mm. Um, but yeah, maybe you, you give him a lot to work with. Maybe he gets a little distracted by it. I don't know. Yeah. It, but I've seen it happen. He, he was, you look at something like Joel Schumacher. You give Joel mm. Schumacher no money, he can make you a fun and even decent movie. Mm. Give him a lot of money, he has no idea what to mm. do with that money. Batman and Robin is a, is a much worse yeah. film than Tigerland. Yeah. Tigerland's yeah. actually quite good. <laughs> like, I feel the same way about Peter Jackson and, and mm. Sam Raimi. I've said that before. I think they're they're great when they have no money at all. Mm. Um, I, I, I think Meet the Feebles is better than any Hobbit movie. <laughs> Well, yeah, the ho- st- okay, the Hobbit trilogy, I'll give you that. No, any film with a Hobbit in it. Shut up. <laughs> That's stupid. Yeah. But the Hobbit trilogy, I'll well, give you Well, maybe that. not Meet the Feebles, but Dead Alive. Okay, yes, yes. <laughs> Actually, yes. Yeah. Dead Alive and uh, uh, Heavenly Creatures, I would say both there of those. There you are, are better films than, than, probably, than his bigger blockbusters. That's probably true. And they're all better than King Kong. I don't know. What, what's what's I like King Kong. Why does everyone hate King Kong? I don't know. King Kong. I know it's too long. King Kong, like, Lovely Bones, so three Hobbit films. He he needs to come back. We want, we're I'm, waiting for Peter Jackson to come back. Yeah. Um. Anyway, but you can tell that Duncan Jones is trying to say something eventually uh, by focusing on the young girl character because you know her her fate ends up being wrapped up in a lot of this and mm. there's a lot of really horrid, sudden, depressing violence that you're not going to expect in this movie. It's a brutal film. Yeah. It becomes really, really depressing when you realize who's getting away with what. And it's eventually uh, dedicated to Duncan Jones' parents, who both died rather recently. So he's clearly working through uh, a lot of sadness. And he's grieving uh, being, you know, a, a child alone now. And mm-hmm. it, it's that that sense of depression is fine to explore and it's really palpable, but it doesn't necessarily make this thing that started out as this noir thriller into what he wanted. It's like it changed into something else during production. Yeah. And he finally found what the theme was going to be right near the end. He just sort of tacked it on. The, uh, filmmakers dealing with the topic of grief mm-hmm. can be really, really tricky. Because on one hand, you can do it uh, through melodrama. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's tacky, but it's usually quite effective. Uh, yeah. it's, it's a cheap shot to see like someone's parents die in a movie. But it works if you've mm-hmm. ever experienced that. Um, but then there are films where you can tell... like the filmmaker made this at a point in their life where it was very difficult and the movie came out kind of weird. And I've yeah. heard the, the counselor described that way. Okay. A Ridley Scott film that mm. was made shortly after the death of his brother, Tony Scott. Uh, and it's a bizarre and surreal expo- exploration of human darkness and mm. grief. Yeah. And I don't think it works, but when viewed through that lens, it sure is interesting. It, when you try to see it as a, a treatise on grief, the counselor, you can see that the the filmmaker was grieving, mm. but unfortunately, the audience is as well. Yeah, the, because they're watching the counselor. It doesn't translate. It mm. feels like maybe this is like a piece of poetry you should mm. have like not published. Yeah. you know, like if that you, kind of thing. If you go to a filmmaker like this is Her- more for you than it is like for anyone, else. Herzog, or more than that, Lars von Trier, who constantly makes films about his own depression, he's committed. 
he's committed to depression. He yeah. knows what he wants to explore. He knows what he wants to say to the audience about his own depression and what he's experienced. Duncan Jones is trying to make one thing and his own darkness is sort of leaking in. Yeah. Again, makes it might that might make it kind of interesting to watch, but it's not a really solid film. It's really, really kind of loose. All right. Well, let's talk about uh, another big release this week. It's a movie called Every Day. No, right. I which, did not see this one. Which is so one right. of the more interesting concepts for a, a romance, especially like a YA kind of romance, uh-huh. uh, I've ever seen, actually, to be perfectly honest. Uh, it stars uh, a young actor named Anne Gary Rice. Uh, you might remember her. I think she was the daughter in The Nice Guys. Okay. Um, she was really great in The Nice Guys. Yeah, she's fun. She's awesome. Uh-huh. Uh, so she plays a, a relatively normal teenage girl. She's dating a guy. He's a bit aloof. Mm-hmm. Cares more about basketball than he does about the relationship. And uh, she... One day she goes to school and her boyfriend acts vi- completely different. Mm. He's very sensitive, thoughtful, listens to her, doesn't give a shit about all of the boring things he used to give a shit about. And they ha- they skip school and they have the best, most romantic day ever. <laughs> and then the next day he's back to being his boring self. A hmm. couple of days later, she gets a, a, a strange text saying, you know, meet me here. Mm. She does. And it turns out that her boyfriend that day, and indeed several of the people she has met in the interim, were all the same person. A person named A, like the letter, Mm. uh, who doesn't (gasps) have a body. Is it short for Azazel? The body jumping angel from the movie Fallen? Okay, kind of. Because the whole thing with Uh. A is uh, A wakes up in a different person's body every day. Mm -hmm. Always like the same age as A. Okay. So right now A is a teenager, and 20 years he'll... He, she, A, will pop into the bodies of 40-year-olds or whatever. Mm. Um, so as not to make it too creepy. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of dancing around the concept mm. here. Um, a always jumps into a different body every day. It's never the same body twice. Mm. They only get 24 hours. And A has to kind of live their day, because what else is A supposed to do? Mm. But A is also trying to stay out of the way as much as they can. Right. But A fell in love with this young woman. And they're, he's, A is trying to make it work. <laughs> and it's a really, really complicated premise. And Given this cosmic hiccup. Yeah, it's basically like, we, it's kind of like, the, it's kind of like Death Note. I didn't see Adam Wingard's version of it, but if you read the manga or you watch the anime, it's basically, we came up with this neat idea for a sci-fi fantasy concept, but we end up, kind of the whole story ends up being about the rules. Yeah. So... What are the rules if you're dating someone who hops into the body of a different person every day? You don't know who the person you're dating is going to look like tomorrow. Right. You don't know if they're going to be capable of going to see you tomorrow because maybe there's someone who doesn't have a car mm. or maybe there's someone who uh, – there's maybe, one day – Maybe they're in the hospital. Who exactly. Knows? That yeah. happens once. Exactly. Okay. Um, so that is – there's complete chaos in that regard. At its best every day mm. – it becomes a really potent metaphor for a sort of romantic and sexual awakening when you realize that it is possible to love someone for who they are, not their body. Okay. And that, you know, she, her, she, her idea of romance becomes incredibly fluid. Mm. Because after a while, she's dating yeah. literally everybody. <laughs> and it toys with it toys with ideas of polyamory mm. because, you know, A will wake up in the body of someone who has a big anniversary dinner with their boyfriend tonight. I, I can't miss that. I would wreck mm. their life. I have to do that. <laughs> like, and they, yeah, and they tackle, mm. maybe not as well as they should have, the idea of, yeah, you jumped into you like leaped into the body of my boyfriend Mm -hmm. and had a romantic day with me under false pretenses so that that, that's That's weird yeah that's not polite a's only like defense is like what am i supposed to do like it's a weird situation i'm doing the best (laughs) i can and like yes but again you get kind of wrapped up in the weird questions of it is it always a boy or does she fall in love with women too men women and i believe at least one trans person oh wow okay um and i and i appreciate that in fact she actually asks a do you consider yourself a boy or a girl and a just sort of like wiggles their hand like <laughs> like I've been both. I've been both. Yeah. Like half the time I'm both. Like mm-hmm. I, I don't I don't really know the difference. Um and yeah, on one hand it's like this beautiful exploration of we're all the gender the same, fluidity. Yeah, 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 gender fluidity. We're all the same person. Uh everyone's experience is unique but also universal. And at its best, it's that. And it's really, really sweet. It's really, really great. Kudos to the casting director on this thing. <laughs> because like dozens of people have to play the same character and it it always works. 
You never question it. It always feels like the same character. That's hard to pull. I would love to know if the director got all of those actors in one room and just like had to direct them all at once. I would not be surprised if they did some sort of workshop. In any case, it it plays great. It's really consistent. The problem with the movie, again, it just you start asking the questions, and the movie (laughs) answers quite a few of them. Doesn't always answer them well. Uh And I actually disliked the ending, which I think is frustrating Hmm. because you're watching this movie, and the whole point of the movie is about opening your mind to uh, diversity to different uh, gender identities, to different mm-hmm. uh, uh, various issues about you know the idea of who you are in your head doesn't match your body. They, there's a lot of big issues, and I feel like the ending kind of like takes this kind of easy way out where it kind of skews a little like normative. And I don't uh, think it, I don't think it needed to. I think it's I think it's a bit of a cop out. But just again, somebody, somebody didn't like stick a knife in a toaster and like got stuck in that body through like no some, that would have been, been si- stupid. silly action conceit. No, no, that would have been stupid. I just feel like it. I feel like the protagonist has her you know mind awakened mm-hmm. and uh, uh, her consciousness expanded to this un- incredible degree, mm-hmm. and the movie kind of leaves her kind of a little bit more back where she started than they, than it needed to, and it feels like we didn't go on it. We went on way too big a journey to go. To Not go, very far. To go back to the start. And I thought that was a damn shame. But I, I know it's interesting, a and lot I of those, credit for that. A lot of those catharses can feel that way when you're a teenager, to be fair. You can mm-hmm. you know, have this sort of big romantic awakening. You can... You know, <sighs> You can lose your virginity. You can move on into your like this new sexual plane and this new romantic plane. You still got to go to high school the next day. You That's know, your true. life is still going to be kind of normal. But if you're going to tell a story about that, you're mm. going to tell this fantastical allegorical story about that, and you're going to like sort of backtrack or digress or, or whatever. Like at the end, like it does indeed happen in real life. Mm. You would better make damn well sure the audience knows that that's the point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because if it's just sort of incidental, it's just like I thought we were watching some kind of fable, like something with a moral to it, mm. and the moral just kind of isn't as big as it should have been, like, right at the uh, end. So, so it's a neat idea, but not a good story. It, if it sounds like an interesting concept to you, anyone who's listening, it's worth watching. Like, it's interesting. It's certainly it's a neat idea. They pull it off way better than I think most people could have. Mm. And, again, you want to see, like, a really interesting feat of acting where everyone, like, a whole bunch of people have only, like, a couple of lines of dialogue or only, like, a couple of scenes to play the exact same character mm. as that character grows and evolves over the course of a film. That's tough, and they pulled it off, and I'll give him endless credit for that. Okay. All right, tell me about, uh, is it The Cured? The Cured. Okay. Uh, the Cured is an Irish zombie film that's uh, playing in art houses uh, this weekend. It stars Ellen Page and, uh, oh golly, I forgot the lead actor's name, but it takes place in a future world where the zombie outbreak happened, and they found a cure for it, and they were able to pull some people back, people who were zombies or just sort of charging about. They're sort of like 28 Days Later type Mm. zombies. They're just wrathful beings that run really fast and just kill indiscriminately. And just sort of kill and eat and kill and eat. Uh, But we found a zombie cure. We can bring people back, and they can remember everything they did. Yeah. And now uh, it's we've tr- had like three waves of these people that we've cured, and we're slowly letting them back into society. They're going through these sort of rehabilitation camps, which are essentially military beating camps, mm. and then they're released back into society. This is very clearly a metaphor for prisoners being released back into society. Right? People have gone to prison for a horrible crime. They do their time. They get back out, and the world hates them. They can't get jobs. Mm-hmm. Uh, And likewise, the cured can't get jobs. People don't want to work with somebody who used to be a zombie, somebody who potentially ate other people when, you know, they were under cover of this virus or whatever it was. That's a that's a that's a good allegory. It's it's a really good. I mean, zombies are universal allegory. They they can be used used for a lot. Uh, I think most typically they tend to be used for like disease. But you uh, look at disease something like disease and apocalypse yeah. and sort of the dissolution of society. Yeah, yeah where yeah. like uh, if all of although, society collapses and we're no longer at the top of the food chain, mm-hmm. what do we become? Yeah. That's one of the most common tropes. Um, you look at the original Light of the Dead; it has some racial underpinnings. You look at Dawn of the Dead; it's about you know it's shot in a mall. They they only ha- found a cool setting; they're going to shoot it in a mall. But yeah. it turns out by coincidence, and it's a good makes it about allegory. yeah about consumerism. Yeah, the third uh, one was about Cold War paranoia. A lot of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, for, uh, the Land of the but, Dead was about the one percent. Day of the Dead is so damn good. By the it's way, so great. I love Day. Like really I, I only underrated. watched it for the first time like a couple of years ago, and I, I regret that I had had Dawn of the Dead put in my mind by so many people as the high watermark because I thought Dawn of the Dead is kind of dull. I think Dawn I, of the not, Dead. Night of the Living Dead is great. 
I think yeah. Dawn of the Dead is it's important kind of, it's, and it's influential. It's important, but, it's influential, but it's kind of a drag to watch. Yeah. And Day of the Dead is the party you want a zombie movie to be because <laughs> there's all kinds of wild crap in that movie. Oh golly! Um, yeah, The Cured is very, very directly a metaphor for the prisoner experience. Uh, and what's more, the people who have been cured are no longer targeted by infected zombies. So oh. they, they kind of have essentially the the guys on the inside on their team. And because they cannot get jobs, because they're so hated by the rest of society, uh, one rogue cured man decides to let the zombies out and, and infect everyone. Uh-huh. And that's the big sort of thriller element. So if you want the sort of vi- if you want the zombie violence and all the mayhem in the world at world gone mad, this has that, too. Uh, it's depressing AF. Um <laughs> The, the cured has no moments of levity. It's all uh, contemplation. It's all suffering, and with each revelation, the suffering just deepens. So you loved it. Uh, I dug it. I dug yeah, it. Yeah, that makes. Yeah, I saw that. Um, <laughs> going, yeah. When you started talking about how depressing it was, I'm just like Whitney Listen. liked it. <laughs> no. L- I just talked about how Mute was a drag, and that's no fun to watch. But, but that's but that's depressing are, because it wasn't very good. It's uh, not because depressing because it's exploring depressing themes, yeah. and you live for that, don't you? So sometimes, sometimes yeah. I can get behind that. Yeah, watch like Oscar nominated live action films. I'm just depressed. But yeah, this one I think is a really really fascinating look at the way we tend to unhinge in the face of hopelessness mm. and. It's really, really savvy about the way hopelessness is something that we constantly need to fight, especially when we're trying to seek redemption. Mm. It's like if you committed a crime, you know, even if you're a zombie at the time, <laughs> are you go- are you going to be worthy of redemption? Right. And a lot of societies say you'll never be worthy of redemption. You will say to yourself often, "I'm never going to be worthy of redemption." And then there's going to be those moments of brightness where you think, "Maybe I." can do this. Yeah. Maybe I can be human with an asterisk, you know, human with a crime underneath me, but still a human. Uh, yeah. And I, I think it's, it's incredibly smart. It's really well acted. Ellen page is terrific. She's a great actor. Uh, she, you know she ends up in a lot of junk, unfortunately, like yeah, flatliners. She was, was in the remake of, of, of flatliners. She did yeah. not belong in that. Well, I, it was, a, frankly, everyone in flatliners was better than that remake of flatliners. Oh, that's true. It's not even yeah. the worst movie ever. It's just sort of there. Yeah. And it's just like, it's such a great concept. You got such a good cast and nothing. Mm. Like nothing new. You're not really going to. Oh, that's a shame. We're going to just uh, make it boring and kind of forgettable. Yeah. Flatliners. All right, flatliners. Fittingly. Ha. Uh, okay. Lastly, tell uh, me about because it's this one either uh, the young Karl Marx. This is like a YA adaptation about the adventures of a young Karl Marx. Yeah. Karl Marx is a teen warrior in the distant future, Ooh. and he holds out his fist, and a bow appears in his hands, Ooh. and he cannot kind of pull back an imaginary bowstring, and a giant eagle appears in his hand. Ooh. And he lets go of the eagle, and, it, and he can far see, and he can see through its eyes, and shoot lightning out his. No, none of all that. All of happens. that sounds cool. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. I want to see all that. If that was a cartoon series in the 1980s, I would have had all the toys. That <laughs> well, sounds great. If I could go back in time to the 1980s, I would pitch the young Karl Marx. <laughs> it's about Karl Marx and Frederick Engels authoring the Communist Manifesto. Ah. And in the 1840s. Uh, and yeah, young Karl Marx. He's young. He marries uh, Vicky Creeps from Phantom Thread. Oh, she's great. great. And uh, she sadly is once again. Shouldered with a really common role uh, in biopics, the smarter than the man in the middle of the picture woman who has to stand behind the man in the middle of the picture. Mm -hmm. You see that role in a lot of these biographies. There's like two of them in Darkest Hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 that's a pretty good movie, but it like it relies on that trope like, yeah. really heavily. I, and I understand, you know, they're trying to say that the great men never do it alone. Mm-hmm. There's always, you know, a, a whole team yeah. of people and you know women in in the picture as well who are facilitating all of this. And granted, throughout history, women have unfortunately been sidelined by society. Yeah, yeah. And there's so, only been so much you know they could do within reason, and that's a fucking shame. But like when you use it as this dramatic device, mm-hmm. where here's the important man. And here's the woman, women as a supporting the woman who's characters. a little off to the side. Yeah, the then, are, don't you feel appreciated? Um, no, that sucks. <laughs> so this movie is it takes it takes place you know all over Europe. Uh, the actors speak English, French, and German as they're trying to put together this communist manifesto, which was needed at the time because of the industrial revolution. Right, people had to work these machines twenty four hours a day. They were getting grievously injured. Mm-hmm. They were getting paid peanuts, and rich tycoons were getting wealthy off of their blood. Yeah. 
And, you know, there were some unions that weren't working quite well. Well, Karl Marx comes in and says, well, but the workers are the ones making all of this. Yeah. Let's give the power to the workers. And he sort of, that's where it all started. And that started making the Communist Manifesto as a result. Um, the revolution started, occurs after this movie, which means all we have are people sitting around in rooms discussing theory and talking about writing a book. You loved it, didn't you? No. it's actually what? It's actually boring as sin. What? Uh, I thought you loved boring as sin. <laughs> ordinarily, yes. But if you're going to have a movie about violent communist revolutions... Can we have, like, some daring or some excitement in these ideas? Can we have more than just scenes of guys in suits sitting around talking about writing the Communist Manifesto? I mean, you can have scenes of guys in suits, mm. like, just arguing I mean, about, like, it, again, Darkest Hour is another example of this. Mm. People, a lot of that movie is just people in a bunker arguing, but they're arguing about fate of the world shit. Fate of the world there's, stuff, and jo- Joe, Wright, Joe Wright is, like, such a, a peppy pil- filmmaker that he likes to sort of swirl his camera around, and, you know, the people who are having debates in Parliament aren't just sitting still, they're all standing up and shouting shouting nothing's happening they're just all standing up and shouting (laughs) there's no standing up and shouting and the one moment of irony comes near the end and this is something that's been said of Karl Marx and and Engels before that they're writing this book and they're trying to essentially make a popular book so they can get kickbacks and they can get wealthy and take care of their families they essentially want to become the bourgeois that they're writing against of course and they actually say that out loud it's like you realize you know it's like "I'm, I'm going to be a revolutionary yeah but still need to feed our kids Mm -hmm. i I need money off of this thing and they even say hey we're kind of becoming bourgeois aren't we yeah yeah that's the the irony is not lost on me and i'm Karl marx (laughs) (laughs) so i i feel like i've seen this type of biography a hundred times before i'm back on uh one of the very first episodes of the B-Movies podcast, uh, I reviewed a film called Goethe! Exclamation point. Oh, I forgot about, about that. About young yeah. Goethe in love. And it's, it, was, it was called Goethe in love, wasn't it? In America, it was called Young Goethe in love. Ah. In, in Germany, it was just called Goethe! Exclamation point. Ooh. I like that title better. It's fun. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's about sort of a very well, kind of well-known character going through a well-documented period in their life, just simply dramatized using lush photography and good costumes and good acting. Okay, uh, we know the story. Why, why? What warrants making cinema out of this? And they're not finding that in in this. And then at the very end, you realize what they were getting at. They're trying. They this the filmmakers think this film is super revolutionary. Well, of course. And just talking about these things, and you know, the revolution happened because they uh, they start cutting to still photographs and you know. Uh, newspaper headlines of the revolution as it's going on and they cut forward and other revolutions and other social movements cropping up in other countries and we go to america and we see civil rights revolutions meanwhile like a rolling stone is playing on the soundtrack over the credits bob dylan song it's like the most very thunningly stupidly obvious music cue i've seen in a movie in a long long time which is like we're like we're like (laughs) remember when lars von trier put uh young americans over the credits of like dogville and manderley okay but at the end it's it's even worse than that but at the end of dogville it seemed like a relief well it it, it was like like, oh thank god it was like a big ironic punch in the face yeah it was really obvious but that whole film is obvious but at least there was some levity like at least it was a joke and, and, and it's kind of like a bright song. It's yeah. like, nah, man, we're, we're changing the world, man. Man. And I, under, I appreciate, you know, some people get together, get together in a room. They set out to change the world. And some of them do it. And yeah. Karl Marx was one of those people who set out to do it and did it. Okay, that's an interesting thing to ponder. G- give me some drama, please. Give, yeah. me, give me a film. Why is that? Why is that you know? a film? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. interesting to think about, but why is it a it's, story? It's, it's like just it totally flat. The movie is just totally flat. All right. So I take it on the critically acclaimed scale of mm-hmm. C minus to C plus, uh, the adventures of young Stalin in love, <laughs> played by Karl Marx, <laughs> set in thirty thirty eight, <laughs> and Sherlock, the reincarnation of Sherlock Holmes is now a dog. Again, you just make it sound better and better. I guess I, I'm guessing it gets a C minus. It gets a C minus. It's not a disaster, but yeah, it's just kind of boring. What about the cured? The cured. I'm going to give a, a, again a C plus, but not a hugely enthusiastic one. But yeah, really, really powerful stuff. Okay, and mute. Uh, mute a C minus. It's uh, a mess. All right. Uh, every day. Every I'm, day. I'm going to give this a C. Mm-hmm. Um, like right in the middle, because like if they just maybe explored the questions that they asked more, and if they just maybe landed the ending more, would have been a very enthusiastic C plus. But as mm-hmm. it stands, they tried something interesting. 
didn't work out as well as maybe it could have, mm. but I'm impressed it worked as well as it did. And I do think there are going to be people who see this movie and are very interested in all of the things that at least attempt. Okay. Um, so that's a C. Uh, Game Night, C+. Plus. A C+. Funny plus. movie. Yeah, really funny. Well-crafted, mm. top bottom, well-made. Uh, and Annihilation. Uh, Annihil- right now, Annihilation is right on the cusp between C and C plus, but I suspect it's going to tip into C plus the more I think about it. Because well, I think there's yeah, you got to give it one. Okay, uh, I'll give it a low C plus then. Okay, I'm going to give it a high C. I okay. just found it again. There are parts of it that feel a little bit more derivative than they probably should, okay. and uh, at the same time. It's dynamic to look at. Mm. Um, there are some really, really great moments and scenes in there. There's, there's one really, really creepy scene with an animal. I'm not going to ruin it for you, <laughs> but it did not go anywhere. I was even remotely expecting it. <laughs> um, so, like, there's good stuff in there. I'm just not too super enthusiastic about it right now. Mm. I reserve the right to change my mind, as I do about everything else. Yep. That's how life works. Uh, um, but we've written down something we can't change our minds about. No, once we have uh, made up our minds on this, these are our Oscar predictions for the year. And I want to preface this by saying, you know, there's a lot of years at the Oscars, a lot, mm. which seem like, if not foregone conclusions, then relatively straightforward. It's going to be between one or two films. Yeah. Um, this is not one of those years. This is one of the weirdest yeah, years of Academy I mean, Award nominations ever. I remember when... Uh, there was a big uh, to do as to whether or not Gravity or Twelve Years a Slave was going to win Best Picture. Could not be two people, more different films. And people were, uh, typically looked to uh, the PGA, the Producers Guild, mm-hmm. uh, because historically they were always predicted the Best Picture winner. And everyone's saying, "Oh, it's going to be Gravity, Twelve Years a Slave, Gravity, Twelve Years a Slave." Come out of the PGA, it's a tie. It was Gravity and Twelve Years a Slave, Damn both it. won. So no, everyone was. In a tizzy over that. A lot of the, slave ended up a lot the, of the tried and truisms at the Oscars are mm-hmm. changing. The film with the most uh, Oscar nominations usually throughout history has won the Best Picture Award. Mm-hmm. Not so much lately. Yeah. Usually throughout history, the Academy Award for Best Director and Best Picture sync up about nine out of ten times. Mm-hmm. In the last like decade, it's happened a lot. <laughs> so. And and honestly, like you look at like what is considered like what's the safe bet? Mm-hmm. Like in the nineties, someone pointed this out on Twitter, I can't remember who, but like in the nineties, Darkest Hour would be the front runner for Best Picture. It's just the safe, yeah, historically yeah. significant, well acted, one, period one drama. Big, yeah, one big standout performance, good funny makeup. This year <laughs> this year, if you wanna like just totally play it safe, mm. The safest, least political, kind of least interesting Mm. choice the Academy is likely to make for something like Best Picture is a movie about a woman who has sex with a fish monster. Yep. That's a weird year. We have kind of a strange year. So but let's go. We're not going to start with Best Picture. We're going to start yeah. uh, closer to the bottom. Uh, we have a we have a let's, various let's, ballots here, yeah, and let's let's run through quickly. So yeah, I, we're I not going to take too long. We're going to talk them. about who will win mm-hmm. and also who we think should win if we were voting. Um, why don't you go on yours because mine okay. are listed alphabetically and okay. it's kind of strange. Uh, mine are mine are. I'm, I'm going off of the Oscar ballots from the All Oscars right. website. Okay, uh, so that's how I filled out mine. Let's start with a big one. Let's start with Best Original Screenplay. Again, it's a great year for this category. Yeah. And so. Uh, the the nominees are The Big Sick, Get Out, Lady Bird, The Shape of Water, and Three, bil- three Billboards. Um, Get Out will win. I uh, think it's going to be its consolation prize. Uh, I think it's going to be the only Oscar it will win. It is also up for director, picture, and actor. Um, but I think this is going to be the one where it's going to sort of move in. Uh, although I think The Big Sick should win. <laughs> I think Get Out, The Big Sick, and uh, uh, Lady Bird in particular are mm. wonderful screenplays. And I would have a hard time picking between any of them. I think in the end, I'd probably pick Get Out, but feel super guilty for not mm. picking The Big Sick. Because okay. I love that movie. And I'm bummed that that only got that one nomination. Yeah, I'm yeah. still amazed it didn't at least sneak in Best Picture, considering there's supposed <laughs> to be ten nominees. Um, but yeah, I think Get Out's going to win this. Mm. Um, but I'm not going to be surprised if literally anything else makes it this is i yeah, think it's going to yeah, be yeah. close but like um, literally any of these could win the oscar and i would not be shocked but i am, I am picking get out as well okay. my second choice would be three billboards because that that screenplay has been getting a lot of attention i in terms of will win yeah, yeah it's yeah, really yeah. quite likely um adapted screenplay the nominees are call me by your name mm-hmm. the disaster artist logan molly's game and mudbound um now, this is another one where it's a good category, but I think a couple of these are real long shots. I don't think The Disaster Artist has any traction right now. Logan is, I think, the Oscar nomination is the award. Yeah. Um, I, I, I wish it was Logan, because I, I, I just I, I dug Logan really hard. I think um, I think if it were me voting, I would vote for Logan. Mm-hmm. Molly's Game just doesn't have any traction. It's like it's, it doesn't have a lot mm-hmm. of nominations. Mudbound is a maybe. For me, I think it's between Mudbound and... Mm-hmm. 
Call Me By Your Name, but I think a lot of people love Call Me By Your Name, and it didn't get a lot of nominations. I think this is where Call Me By Your Name gets its I, Oscar. I agree. I'm, uh, we're, okay. we're, we're two and two so far. Okay. Uh, Best visual effects. Uh, the the nominees are uh, Blade Runner 2049, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, Kong Skull Island, Star Wars The Last Jedi, and War for the Planet of the Apes. Uh, Blade Runner with a bullet, uh, it's kind of an obvious one. The special effects are impressive in all of those. Yes. Uh, they all have different looking special effects, which I really appreciate, especially when you consider Guardians of the Galaxy and its rainbow vomit pinball machine aesthetic. <laughs> I think uh, what you look at in this category, though, if you look at historically, like the last like 20 years or so in this category, the Academy prefers, whenever possible... To vote for the visual effects film that is least embarrassing to write on a ballot. Doesn't matter how good the visual effects yeah. are, Guardians of the Galaxy isn't like high quality, quote unquote, cinema. Yeah. In that pretentious sort of way, which of course means nothing. Uh, but like, you look at like, they, they give like Hugo. Mm. An Academy Award for Best Visual Effects. That was not really the most impressive visual effects that year, but it was they're, a classy they're film. Pretty, they're pretty good, and it's, it's a, good. it was a movie about movies. So, so I'm yeah. actually with you on this. I think Blade Runner 2049 is going to get this. Ex Machina mm. won this award a couple years ago, even mm. though it wasn't the flashiest either. It was the classiest film, so yeah. I think that's where they're going to go. Okay. Uh, however, if I were voting, I would also vote for Blade Runner 2049 because it's a perfectly realized world. Yeah, yeah. well, and, and it, it just... It's so great to look at. It's so great of, yeah. of, of the worlds that were created here. Um, sound editing and sound mixing for the first time has no deviation. Usually there's like one that's in one category and not the other. I think it's happened other. before, but it was a long it's time It's been ago. a long time. Yeah. But in both of these categories, the nominees are ba- Baby Driver, Blade Runner, Dunkirk, The Shape of Water, and Star Wars. Um, I really wished – I almost voted for Baby Driver in both categories. Yeah. Because Baby Driver is a film that is uh, – edited to its sound uh it, mm. the editing is one of the more impressive noticeable editing jobs that you that you'll probably see in the year just because it's constructed around its music and i would not write it off because mm. you know, i remember whiplash like one like one of these categories like a couple yeah. years ago and like that would seem like kind of a long shot but people noticed musically it the sound actually was really really yeah. important but, but I, who do you think is going to win i think in both categories it's going to be blade runner really yeah okay see i pick for both categories i pick dunkirk Okay, because I think Dunkirk is the kind of film that the Oscars love to reward. It's a huge war <laughs> epic, and it's, I feel and, like it's fallen in the Academy's estimation I think since so. it came out. Though. But I do think, from a technical perspective, it's hard to completely deny it. And I got it in a few categories mm. because just when you come right down to it, yeah, great sound, World War II movie, Christopher Nolan. We we like him, but just not enough to give him a bunch of Oscars. Let's uh, give him the sound categories. So All I'm right. going Dunkirk for both. Okay. Okay, and you're going Blade Runner for both. I'm going Blade Runner for both. Okay. So we he, here we start to deviate. Nice. Okay, um, let's talk about best live action short film. Uh, uh, we we reviewed all of the li- uh, the shorts, live action, animated, and documentary on mm-hmm. a recent episode of the Critically Acclaimed podcast. If you want to learn more about all of them, you can find out right there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the nominations are uh, DeKalb Elementary, mm-hmm. The Eleven O'Clock, My Nephew Emmett, The Silent Child, and Watu Wote. Mm-hmm. All of us. This is a really tough category. Not just because like it's hard to predict. There aren't a lot of precedents, but because those are those are all good yeah, movies tr- and it's tricky. Traditionally, traditionally, the outlier of this category tends to win if they're all depressing and there's one comedy. The comedy wins if they're all comedies and there's one depressing. The depressing wins. There's one comedy, but I don't think it's going to pull it out this year. I don't think it's sharp uh, the, enough. I feel like I it's do, a little sketch. I do like the eleven o'clock. That's the comedy, but um, I think it's going to go to my nephew Emmett, the Emmett Till film. Really? Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So I actually I was really really torn, mm. but. Between The Silent Child, uh, which is a very uh, uh, dramatic, very well-crafted film about uh, a deaf girl and a family doesn't appreciate her, and To Call Elementary, which is about uh, a school shooting. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, ultimately, it's a tough call. I'm actually going to go with To Call Elementary. I think I the politics kind of, of it is... Kind of topical right now. I think it's so topical, I think mm-hmm. it's going to have an extra impact yeah, on anybody right. who watches it right now. So, yeah, But that's going to be real tough. Uh, animated short film. Mm-hmm. The uh, nominees are Dear Basketball, Garden Party, Lou... Negative Space and Revolting Rhymes. Again, they're all pretty impressive in their own way. Mm. I think Dear Basketball has the emotional headshot where it's just really just super intense. And I think just Kobe Bryant Oscar winner is a hell of a narrative. And the Oscars love narratives. They they love narratives. They love John Williams. This feels the most cinematic of the shorts, even though Lou was the one most people probably saw cinematically. I I wish it could have been Lou or uh, Revolting Rhymes. Mm. Those are my favorites to watch. I think Derek Basketball is the, the smart movie. Okay, so we're both on that one. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about production design. Uh, nominees, Beauty and the Beast. Blech. Uh, Blade, 
<laughs> hate, hate, hate that movie. Didn't um, care for it either. Blade Runner 2049, Darkest Hour, Dunkirk, and The Shape of Water. Um, it's tempting to say The Shape of Water, uh, and I'm guessing it, The Shape of Water might win the most Oscars, but... Uh, I'm going against my heart, <laughs> which is which is not wise, and voting for Blade Runner on this one too. I think um, there's just too too much impressive artistry going into Blade Runner to ignore. I, I even agree. though it was a terrifically unpopular movie, I, I agree that there's too much terrific artistry in Blade Runner 25 to ignore, mm. which is why I think the Academy will ignore it. <laughs> uh, and in fact, I went I went against my heart too. My heart said Blade Runner 2049, a mm. movie I think is very impressive. Uh, I'm actually going with Shape of Water. Okay. I think Shape of Water is um, it's lived in and homey. There's enough real environments that the unnatural environments, the underground laboratories and everything, mm-hmm. they really just pop yeah. uh, in a way that I think they're going to want to reward. And uh, yeah, so for me, uh, that's that's my pick, Shape of Water. Right. Um, let's talk about best original song. Oh, you want to do documentary short? Uh, well, and that's not the next one on my list, but sure, we oh, can do that one next. Yeah, let's do all the shorts at once. Okay. Edith and Eddie, Heaven is a Traffic Jam on the 405, Heroin, uh, Heroin uh, Knife Skills, and Traffic Stop. Uh, again, we talked about these recently. I'm going to go for Heroin. It is the most inspirational of those films. I th- just think it's the best one. I think it's the most inspirational. I think it's the most well crafted mm-hmm. overall. I think it gets everything. I think it accomplishes everything it clearly sets out to do. Whereas, yeah, I think you could argue that all the others have certain you know production hiccups that maybe mm-hmm. prevent it from having maximum impact. Heroin is also fantastic. Yeah. So yeah, I'm also going with heroin. It's a great short film uh, about the opi- the opioid crisis. Yeah, yeah. Um. So that's a great one. Let's talk about best original song. Now, there's a few categories uh, in this year's Oscars, which I'm actually I haven't seen all the nominees. In this case, I haven't heard all the nominees. Okay. So I'm not going to say who I think should win because it's not valid. I'm okay. going to go with what I've heard. Where where mm. the most energy seems to be coming from? Uh, there there are two categories where I have to do this. There's yeah. uh, there's three where I have yeah. to do this. Normally I try to see literally everything, mm. and the last few years I've been able to do that. Right. This year not so much. So uh, best original song. The nominees are Mighty River from Mudbound, mm. uh, Mystery of Love from Call Me by Your Name, Remember Me from Coco, Stand Up for Something from Marshall, mm. and This Is Me from The Greatest Showman. And I'm pretty sure this is going to be a horse race between This Is Me and Remember Me. Mm. This is me. Is this very forthrightly exciting? It's going to be great to watch them perform it on stage. Uh-huh. Just kind of poppy, inspirational song. It's a good song, maybe not an amazing mm-hmm. song, but it's a good song. Coco <laughs> is making people cry, <laughs> and which, I think which is why my vote goes for Remember Me. Which my vote goes for Remember Me yeah, as well. I, but I do think if you put This Is uh, This Is Me on there, it's yeah. it's a reasonably safe right. bet. Uh, but uh, I just think Greatest Showman. They didn't get any other nominations. The Academy isn't that fond of it. So uh, Coco is probably uh, going to be not, the film. It's not a great movie. Uh, it's not. I, but it could have gotten like, uh, like I suppose production so, design, costume it's, design. It's a it great. Happen. It's a great crowd pleaser. I loved watching it. But yeah, yeah it's, it, uh, I have to acknowledge that it's not that great a film. Right. I would say it's between Remember Me and Mighty River from Mudround, the okay. Mary J. Blige uh, song. And if Mudbound gets anything, it'll be this. Mm-hmm. But Coco is kind of a steamroller, so yeah. we'll see. All right, the, the category of Best Original Score, really, really, really solid nominees yeah. in this category. So we have, uh, Dunkirk, Phantom Thread, The Shape of Water, Star Wars, and Three Billboards. I was so torn between Phantom Thread and The Shape of Water. I think they okay. both, of, of so, all the nominees um, here, they're the, they're the scores Thread that is, stand out the most uh, and really tell the story. Phantom Thread is Johnny Greenwood, and um, who's done PTA's films in the mm-hmm. past, and um, Shape of Water is Alexandra Desplat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it's Desplat, but yeah. Dude, yeah. Um, Alexandre Desplat. Uh, Alexandre Desplat has a very almost classical sort of romantic movie mm classical movie score and phantom thread is a uh, it's too peculiar it's it's peculiar but it's distinct and i think the usually what you find this category goes to the film whose musical store stands out Mm. and i think both of those films stand Mm. out more than any of the other nominees so i was torn but in the Mm. end i'm gonna go with the shape of water i think it really just it's sweeping it's romantic it tells the story but if it goes to phantom thread i will not be surprised okay um yeah it's also the shape of water that's also my vote um the two the films with the two best best scores of the year were not nominated this year. One was Mother, okay. with its weird sort of scratchy uh, violins just sort of 
taking your spine out. And uh, the other one was Mark Mothersbaugh's score for Thor Ragnarok. Great score. Which, yeah, is like all 80s electronica stuff. I would have thrown Blade Runner on there. I think they did a really good job of evoking something that existed while creating something very new. Okay. So there you go. Yeah, so I don't know why the fun scores never get nominated, Mm. but there you have it. Uh, Next up is makeup and hairstyling, a, Mm. a category which only has three nominees, even though most films have makeup and hairstyling. I think it's bullshit, personally. I, I think I, we should I have five nominees. Yeah, I never understand. I, I guess they need something kind of showy in this category. But so. there's so many, like, Guardians of the Galaxy It was really showy. Thor was really yeah, showy. Yeah. There's a lot of really showy makeup work that they could have put in here. Whatever. Anyway, yeah. the nominees are Darkest Hour, Victoria and Abdul, and Wonder, and it's going to go to Darkest Hour. It's going to go to Darkest Hour. This is a real... That's, that's, that's this is probably the biggest no-brainer on the whole ballot. Mm. Um, not, to, not to knock the makeup in any of those other movies, but they like old-age makeup, mm. and they like... Uh, and they uh, like movies. Cr- recreating a historical figure, turning yeah. an actor into somebody else convincingly. Yep, that's, they that's work all. with the Iron Lady as well. Mm. Um, they are not... They typically don't nominate, or they don't vote for... <clears throat> Excuse me, the big monsters. Even though they're, those are kind of the most impressive to everyone at home. <laughs> All right, moving on. Best foreign language film. This is another one where I have to I have, admit defeat. I, I do I not have, know these films. I have seen one of these five nominees, so I'm going to vote for it. Okay. <laughs> that's that's the I say. I've seen the square. I loved the square, mm-hmm. so I'm going to vote for the square. But I have not seen the other uh, nominees, which are a fantastic woman, the insult, loveless, and on body and soul from. Uh- Chile, Lebanon, Russia, and Hungary. Uh, for this category, and also for Best Feature Documentary, where I haven't seen all the nominees either, mm. I'm going to go with the one that I hear the most about. Yeah, it's based on buzz. Yeah, based on the buzz. So it's from that case, it's between The Square and A Fantastic Woman, and A Fantastic Woman is really talked about okay. a lot. And I think, ultimately, on some level, it is a popularity contest. Uh, yes, so I'm yeah. picking A Fantastic Woman, okay. but this is not coming, this category, my prediction, not coming from a place of learnedness. I'm taking a bit of a stab. Yeah. All right, next up, film editing. Uh, nominees, Baby Driver, Dunkirk, I, Tanya, uh, The Shape of Water, and Three Billboards. Um, these tend to coincide with Best Picture a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, in the last five years, who's to say? Right. But uh, Dunkirk is seems like it's going to be the easy money uh, because uh, Christopher Nolan's films are edited very well. But remember when uh, Inception wasn't nominated? That's insane for editing. Yeah, that was insanity. Um, and I'm guessing that there's that's one of the best edited movies ever. Something about Christopher Nolan's editing that's maybe a little too noticeable. It's been said of editors that if they do their job well, you don't notice at all. And mm-hmm. I think. There has to be some sort of more musical reason to uh, include a showier editing job if you're going to give it an award as such. I'm going to vote for Baby Driver. No shit. I think Baby Driver uh, well, is... Well, that's a bold choice. Yeah, I know. It's it's probably... <clears throat> it's a bit of a long shot, but... A, you're, probably you're a bit taking, of a long shot. I got yeah, a couple think, of long shots coming I, up. I think Baby Driver has the sort of uh, fun, uh, audience-pleasing appeal while uh, still sort of being able to demonstrate its its... Uh, chops. Yeah. Um, I, Tanya, I'm not really sure why that one was nominated for editing. Is it just maybe the skating and putting Ro- Margaret Robbie's face on I the skating? I think it's actually the dramatic structure of the film, okay. the way that it chops between timelines. Yeah, I guess and, so. But that's really kind of inherent to the to the idea of it. That's all mm. in the screenplay. Yes. Yeah, it's well edited, but like, yeah, I'm not, uh, uh, I don't, uh, that wouldn't be my choice either. Uh, for me, when it comes to editing, it's between Baby Driver and Dunkirk. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, in terms of what should win. Mm. What will win, I think, is between Dunkirk and The Shape of Water, because, again, this does usually go hand-in-hand in Best Picture, but I think this is going to be one of those years where it's not a matter of one thing sweeping it. Mm. It's a matter of a lot of the technical awards go to a couple of films, and the big awards go to the smaller yeah, they, films. Well, what they call the above-the-line awards. Yeah, like you look at something like uh, when uh, Gangs of New York won, like, a, no, uh, was it The Aviator? Like, the Aviator won like a ton of below-the-line stuff in yeah. the Best Picture. I think this is going to be one of those. So I think Dunkirk is going to win Best Editing here. Okay, It's just too overtly well-edited Okay, uh, for them to, to yeah. miss it this time. There's not going to be no one that's like, oh, I don't want to watch it. It's sci-fi. World War II, I'll watch that. I'm in the Academy. <laughs> so Dunkirk is my pick. Uh, best uh, documentary feature? I have seen zero of these. Same so here. So th- this is just based on buzz, uh, so, so I can't say much about it. The nominees gonna, are Abacus, yeah. Small Enough to Jail, uh, Faces Places, Icarus, Last Men in Aleppo, and Strong Island. The one everyone is talking about is Faces Places. Uh, the one that is the most politically salient is Icarus. Mm. So I'm going to go for Icarus. Okay. About, about the... Russian political manipulation. Faces Places is directed by Agnes Varda, yeah. who is one of the great 
mm. filmmakers. And I, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think she has an Oscar. Vis- visage, visage. Yes. I think she might, she might have a lifetime achievement. I'd have to look that up. But, but like, I, I think either way, it's, it's just too good. I don't think they'll oh, be okay. able to, to avoid giving her that award. Oh, okay. So that's, that's my pick. Uh, let's move on to, do we do costume design? We do costume design. No, best costume, costume design. Okay, uh, Beauty and the Beast. This one's really funny because there's actually a typo on my ballot. So I have ah. Be- Beauty and the Beast, Darkest Horn, H <laughs> O U R N. It's a huge typo. Uh, Phantom Thread, The Shape of Water, and Victoria and Abdul. Um, people love the p- the period costumes, don't they? Yes, I really, they do. I really wish it was sort of like wild stranger stuff, like you know Thor or whatever. Um, uh, Beauty and the Beast, too opulent. Maybe mm-hmm. darkest hour too suity too many yeah, suits yeah mostly suits um, shape of water too plain hmm. uh, wouldn't surprise me if shape of water won but yeah. I don't think it's the yeah, Victorian the novel duel those are some pretty impressive gowns but you know what movie is about clothing <laughs> Phantom yeah. Thread I think Phantom Thread's got this in a walk yeah, I yeah. think Phantom Thread is just it luxuriates over its costumes mm. you cannot see Phantom Thread and miss how good the costumes are. Yeah, yeah. So I think Phantom Thread is the safe bet here. I mm. agree. Uh, let's look at best cinematography. The nominees are mm. Blade Runner 2049, The Darkest Hour, mm. Dunkirk, Mudbound, and The Shape of Water. Damn good looking movies. It's a whole all, lot All of really good looking. And um, here's, oh, here's, oh, golly. I, I'm what torn do I wanna, here because... I'm also torn. Because I, here's I, the I thing. think I might have voted for the wrong thing, but it's already in ink, so I'm, <laughs> I can't, can't, can't take it back now. Uh, okay, here here is, is my uh, uh, thing with... Mm. Uh, Blade Same. Runner 2049. Okay. Roger Deakins. Who's been nominated how many times? 180? 80, 80 billion times. I want to go over, real quick, I want to go over this, the, the filmography of Roger Deakins, who is probably, uh, arguably, anyway, the greatest cinematographer of Cur- our currently time. Currently working. Yeah. Okay. So, Roger Deakins photographed such incredible motion pictures as Blade Runner 2049, uh-huh. Sicario, Skyfall, True Grit, A Serious Man, uh, no Country for Old Men. Mm. Uh, what are we Co- the Coen Brothers movies, you'll notice. Yeah, we worked with uh, Old Brother Where Art Thou as well. Uh, the Big Lebowski, Courage Under Fire, Fargo, Dead Man Walking, The Shawshank Redemption. Fuck it. He's, he's one of the greats, and he has mm. never won an Academy Award. He's been nominated 14 times. Now, a lot of the time, when someone has been nominated a whole bunch of times... Uh, like Kate Winslet, for example, mm. and oh, or, finally, like or, there's not a lot even, of competition this year. We'll yeah. give it to her for the reader, which is not her best performance, or even but whatever. Or even like John Williams, you know, yeah. he's been nominated. I think in the 30s or 40s. They get this impression that eventually the Academy is just going to cut on some slack. Below the line, a lot of people don't notice. <laughs> a lot of people don't notice <laughs> that someone has been overlooked a lot. I think Blade Runner 2049 is so overtly good looking. <laughs> it's. I think it's, this is the time. It's the, the thing that makes the movie. I think Any this fun is to watch his year, and I think if it isn't his year, I don't want to be the guy who said it wasn't. Okay. So I, I feel like I morally and and also uh, 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 I, uh, sort of ethically obligated because I think it's the best looking movie of the year. Mm. I, I think he has to be the the pick. All right. Well, what do you I, think? I also picked Roger Deakins Good for, for, for uh, twenty forty nine. But now that I'm looking at these nominees, I'm thinking it might be The Shape of Water. I think The Shape of Water, or Mudbound, or Dunkirk are all really like. I think Darkest Hour is a long shot. Yeah. I think the rest of them, it really could go to any of them. Yeah. Except for Darkest Hour. Um, animated feature. Okay. We have The Boss Baby, mm-hmm. The Breadwinner, Coco, Ferdinand, and Loving Vincent. I've only seen two of these. You know, I actually haven't seen all of these either, yeah. so I'm going to refrain again from saying what I think should win. In mm-hmm. fact, I haven't even seen Coco. Really? I still haven't uh, seen it. It right. just never came. It was a long story. Anyway, right. long, long. It's all right. It's all right. I'm embarrassed. You, you I know can, I need to see it, and I will. Up. But I think everyone knows Coco is the front runner here, mm. and we're all going to pick Coco. Yeah, p- picks are, t- I guess, not always, but th- yeah. in the past, they typically have been. Okay, let's talk about Best Actress in a Supporting Role. The nominees are Mary J. Blige for Mudbound, Allison Janney for I, Tanya. Leslie Manville for Phantom Thread, mm. Laurie Metcalf for Lady Bird, and Octavia Spencer for The Shape of Water. And I think it's pretty clear that the two front runners are Allison Janney and Laurie Metcalf. Yeah. And I was really torn because I think if I were voting, I would probably vote for either Leslie Manville or Laurie Metcalf. Mm. I would vote for Leslie Manville. Yeah. Because I love Leslie Manville She's in that fantastic. movie. She's the, the soul, the emotion of that film in a lot of ways. I agree. Uh, but I, I when I came right down to it, mm. I think... I think Allison Janney is going to take it this year. I okay. think she's just she's a bit of a scene stealer. I think mm. Laurie Metcalf 
does some has some huge emotional moments which might sway the Academy, but Allison Janney kind of runs away with a lot of that film. Right, and that's yeah. hard to do in Itania. Yeah. What yeah. do you think? I, I also think Allison Janney really? will win. Uh, so but again, if, on if if I were if I were to vote, I think Leslie Manville should win. I don't know why Octavia Spencer is in there. Not that she gave a bad performance. She just doesn't she doesn't give a particularly she silly performance. She gives like the, the same great performance she always gives. And yeah. there were a lot of other great supporting character moments throughout this year that I would have liked to see rewarded, but here we go. Anyway, uh, the, so let's, the nominees for Best Actor in a Supporting mm. Role mm. are Willem Dafoe for The Florida Project, mm. Woody Harrelson for Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, Richard Jenkins for The Shape of Water, Christopher Plummer for All the Money in the World, uh. and Sam Rockwell for Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Like, all of my favorite potential nominees for this category weren't nominated. <laughs> like, so I'm, I'm actually left with a bunch of performances which are good, mm-hmm. but none of them I'm super passionate about. Uh, if I were voting, I would vote for Christopher Plummer. Okay. It, it's a hell of a statement, and he knocked that role out of the park with almost no preparation. He's really, really good in that movie. Uh, if I were voting, I'd vote for Richard Jenkins uh, for The Shape of Water. He gives the best performance in that movie. Uh, he's the most interesting character in that movie. <laughs> I think even the lead character is less interesting than he is. I think he has a, a, a compassion and a vulnerability that would have played better in the center of the film yeah. than the the... Sally Hawkins. All right, uh, but who do you think will win? Uh, Willem Dafoe, for sure. Really? Yes. Okay. No, no doubt in my mind, Willem Dafoe. Interesting, because I'm actually voting for. I'm actually. I would not. I would not vote for them. Mm-hmm. Not because I think he's a bad actor, just because I don't think this is a good performance. Uh, I think Sam Rockwell is oh, okay. steamrolling through mm-hmm. all of the guilds, everything, and I think the thing with Three Billboards is a lot of people are kind of torn on the film in terms of how it handles its subject matter, and I think with good cause. Uh-huh. It's a problematic movie in a lot of ways. Uh, I think. If you want to reward the film, you reward the actors in it. Mm. And I think the people who do like the film are going to be able to get to do so with this category and maybe uh, Best Actress as well. But okay. I think Sam Rockwell is going to be the winner in this one. Okay. Well, well Willem Dafoe doesn't have an Oscar yet. Willem Dafoe does not have an Oscar yet, and he should. I agree. <laughs> uh, let's talk about Best Actor in a Leading Role. Mm. The nominees are Timothy Chalamet from Call Me By Your Name. Daniel Day-Lewis for Phantom Thread, mm. Daniel Kaluuya for Get Out, Gary Oldman for Darkest Hour, mm. and Denzel Washington for Roman J. Israel Esquire. It's going to be Gary Oldman. It's going to be Gary Oldman. We, yeah, it's so another one where it's pretty obvious. Roman J. Israel should be the front runner. I, Denzel Washington gave maybe the best performance of the year. I would say um, between Denzel Washington and Daniel Kaluuya. I love both of those performances yeah, a lot. Yeah. Daniel Kaluuya gives such a brilliant performance, but he's got to give a brilliant performance where he doesn't know what's going on, and he might be too subtle. <laughs> to see just how brilliant all of his yeah, choices well, are throughout that entire motion picture. I've noticed that the Academy doesn't like to award, reward performances that sort of are general over the film. They like to get, give statuettes to people who have big moments, mm. big speeches, big moments where they break down, big songs. And uh, Darkest Hour is nothing but those. Yeah. Uh, but Roman J. Israel is, too. He has a lot of really great moments and a lot of really so great speeches. And, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that they gave him a nomination. It's a pity that Denzel Washington is not going to be getting the yeah. award because, goddamn, Denzel Washington. <laughs> All right, and then uh, Best Actress in a Leading Role. This is a really tough category this year. Uh, mm. The nominees are Sally Hawkins for The Shape of Water, mm. Frances McDormand for Three Billboards, Margot Robbie for I, Tanya, Saoirse Ronan for Lady Bird, and Meryl Streep in The Post. All of those are fantastic performances. Yeah, yeah. Um, And again, Meryl Streep has a good moment. Uh, one, think, one moment that nobody but Meryl Streep could do. I think, honestly, uh, I would argue that her role in The Post is some of her finest work, period. Um, mm-hmm. But it's there's no... Yeah. There's no uh, momentum behind that movie at all. So I don't. Well, think, plus I, it's it's like the compulsory. Uh, Meryl Streep was in a movie. Okay, here's your Oscar nomination. I think this is a three way close race between Sally Hawkins, Frances McDormand, and Saoirse Ronan. Okay. Not, what about not you? Margot Robbie? I don't think Margot Robbie. I just I if, Tanya I, if, is... I were, if I were voting, I'd vote for Margot Robbie. Really? Um, okay. Uh, I almost voted for Saoirse Ronan. Frances McDormand is my final choice. Um, she's the one who sort of encapsulates the entire theme and all of the rage in that film, and it, she's kind of the reason why people are talking about it. So yeah, she she gets my vote. Uh, I feel the same way. It's a shame because I really I wanted to pick Saoirse Ronan, you, but you still can. I still can, but I honestly think just Frances McDormand is kind of dominating the conversation right now. Okay. And again, whatever you say about the script or the direction, she's. Fantastic. So we got two categories left. Yes. We have di- directing and picture. Uh, the- I don't think they're going to go hand in hand this year. No, I'll tell so you that have, right uh, now. Uh, Christopher Nolan uh, for Dunkirk, Jordan Peele for Get Out, Greta Gerwig for Lady Bird, uh, PTA for Phantom Thread. That's Paul Thomas Anderson. Yes. We call him PTA. Shut up. And Guillermo for The Shape, Shape of Water. Um, if I were voting, I'd vote for Jordan Peele. 
yeah. or Greta Gerwig. <laughs> Either those are, one of those, those are I would two. be I would be really torn. Those are the two. They're all there's all good work here. Yeah. There's no denying um, that. Guillermo del Toro will win this. Okay. For sure. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's a bold choice. Uh, and again, I think, again, it's a weird year when Shape of Water, hmm. a monster movie, <laughs> is considered the <laughs> a, safe a, yeah, bet. A fairy tale monster romance. I'm actually going to go with, because I think this is the one where I'm going to take, maybe not a long shot, but certainly not the front runner. Hmm. Um, when you look at, again, the Academy as a, a words body that likes to craft narratives, hmm. um, I think you want to look at what are they going to try to say. And yeah. I think they probably couldn't say anything better than giving this award to Greta Gerwig. Yeah, I, I think so. she, I think she gives a great. She directed a great film, mm. but I think on top of that, a lot of people think best director and best picture need to be synonymous. Mm. Um, that like if you're the best director, clearly it was the best film, right? Not necessarily. A lot of it's kind of contextual. Mm. Um, so when you look at what Greta Gerwig did with Lady Bird, and you look at like all the all the looks behind the scenes people have did about that movie, she directed that movie in a way other people didn't direct. Yeah. She directed that movie from a place of love and happiness and friendliness. She didn't put her actors through the ringer. It was a positive experience for everyone involved, and that is a hell of a thing to support right now. Yeah. And I think, honestly, I think she's going to get it. But if it goes to Guillermo, I won't be shocked. And if it goes to Jordan Peele, I won't be shocked. Uh, I, I actually will be shocked if it goes to Jordan Peele. I would not. It's honestly, his, it's, his, it's his first film. Uh, that doesn't he's, stop. He's them. got great. Well, I guess. I guess Kevin not, Costner but, won a director award for his first film. I suppose so. Like, Do, and that was Jordan, Kevin Costner. It wasn't even that good a movie. Jordan Peele hadn't been in too many films before. He, mm. He's kind of a neophyte in the cinema world, and I think we're going. I think the Academy is still waiting on him okay. in a way. Although, and I think he's making an, another film already. So good All for right. him. And lastly, uh-huh. uh, for best picture, yeah, call me by your name. Darkest Hour, Dunkirk, Get Out, Lady Bird, Phantom Thread, The Post, The Shape of Water, and Three Billboards. What's, this, best, what's this, best picture? This is tough. <laughs> I do think the safe money, the mm. like, oh, like, she'll probably go to this, mm. is probably The Shape of Water. Yeah. However, I think, again, we're looking at narratives. <laughs> I like their narratives. I think The Shape of Water feels so weirdly safe right now mm, kind of re- retro and apolitical yeah. i can see a lot of people putting it on their list because you gotta remember best picture you don't just vote you rank mm. yeah and that matters so you put something real low it counts but you put something real high it counts mm. and i think get out has enough support from people who think it is so fucking brilliant myself included uh-huh. i don't vote but you know I, I i'm part of that group uh that i think it's gonna rank so high on so many ballots i think it's gonna shoot it up all right and i actually think get out this is a tough call and against a bit of a long shot maybe I think it's going to be Get Out. I think it might be well, a little surprising well, to people, but I'm your, going for your it. Your lips to God's ear, because I love Get Out as well. Yeah. Um, I think the, the Academy... Oh, golly. The Academy doesn't necessarily like to go political, especially overtly political. So mm-hmm. it's not going to be The Post, which is a post-Trump movie for sure. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be Three Billboards. I think they like to be political, um, but they like to be political after the fact and the winners have already been decided. Yeah, I suppose so. You know? Um, it's and it's not going to be Lady Bird or Get Out. I, I just for whatever reason these films don't feel like they have a lot of buzz behind them. I think I hear a lot of buzz for Get Out. Lady Bird. Oh, well. uh, Lady Bird is one of those films. There's a lot of films that get like a lot of love from like critics groups, but then and they get a bunch of nominations, but the Academy just doesn't reward them. Like mm-hmm. um, uh, what was another one? Like The Social Network. It oh, got it got like a Best Screenplay. And I think it got Best Original Score. Was it for Picture Two? It was it? up for it, but yeah. it didn't win. Oh, did that's it? My, that's my point. Is it didn't like it was a little cold to some people. Mm. Like it didn't hit all the things they needed. Lady Bird is not cold, but it's also subtle. And mm. I think maybe it's twee. not. I, I wouldn't call it twee. I don't think it's. I don't think it's cutesy enough to be twee. I think it's very sincere, and I think it's very forthrightly emotional. Mm. I just don't think it. You know, expands very much beyond its place, and that's fine. That's what it needs to be. It's a great motion picture. Mm. But I don't think it's going to hit everyone real hard in the feels. And I think it's going to be Get Out is blew so many minds. It was mm. so good. Basically, I think it's between the two horror movies. <laughs> I, think that's a, I think that's a good year. If Shape of oh. Water wins, I'm going to be like, oh, I would have liked it to have been Get Out. But like Shape of Water would be like, holy shit, a monster movie. Just one best picture. What the fuck? <laughs> Weird. Yeah. So you're going Shape of Water. Shape of Water. Okay. So again, uh, the next episode of the show will come out the Sunday of the Oscars, but we won't know who won the Oscars yet. So we might do like a bonus thing if we can, like a maybe a post Oscars episode, like right afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, so we won't get to these in the next episode, but then the episode after that, we'll we'll mm. it will be decided. And again, the loser will do a direct commentary track with the other person in tow. <laughs> for the film that they disliked the most last year. It'll oh. either be Transformers The Last Night or The Book of Henry. Oh boy, I can't wait. We 
All right, let's move on. Let's 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 uh, 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 let's talk about something fun. Let's take a deep breath. <sighs> Let's think about the Volkswagen Type 1. Okay, so... The Volkswagen Type 1 was introduced in Germany mm-hmm. in uh, the 1930s. It was called you know, Volkswagen, the, uh, the, the people's car. Mm-hmm. It actually has some pretty uh, dark political origins because it was commissioned by the Nazi Party. It sure was. Uh, and it was used by the Nazi Party, but it was such a popular model of car and was so reliable that it mm-hmm. ended up proliferating all over Europe and then all over the world. It's a, it's it was a, a popular model of car for taxi cabs, and in the 1960s, it became hugely popular in America. Yeah. Uh, and, and that brings us to mm-hmm. a little film called The Love Bug from 1968. Mm-hmm. And The Love Bug is an interesting film for a variety of reasons, mm-hmm. partially because it is a film about an anthropomorphic car. Partially because it is the last live-action Disney film that had the direct involvement of Walt Disney mm-hmm. before he died. Uh, it actually started with actor Dean Jones, who was in a lot of these Disney movies. Oh, yeah. um, apparently, he went to Disney and he had a pitch for a racing movie. Uh, and Walt Disney said, no, 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 there's this book. It's called Car Boy Girl. It's written by a guy named Gordon Buford. <laughs> We're doing that, and you're going to be in that. And he's like, oh, okay, shit. And so they ended up making... This movie about a car who's alive, can't talk, mm-hmm. but can beep and can like open its doors and smack you in the butt. Yeah, it can like squirt, pour, squirt, squirt water, oil down oil, your leg, yeah, squirt water, like, water, 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 oil on your shoe. Yep, uh, and it wants people to fall in love, and it likes to race. Like, and that's it. That's it. It's that's ca- its whole big. That's uh, whole big deal. Ha- it, Herbie is clearly intelligent. Like oh, you yeah. can you can talk to Herbie, and it will respond to your voice commands. Um, yeah, it, it, although it tends to follow its owners around kind of like a dog. I think... The, uh, it's, I was, he's named Herbie by uh, Buddy Hackett. Yeah, and in fact, he's, Herbie the name even comes from a Buddy Hackett sketch. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't originally called Herbie. Mm. It also originally wasn't a Volkswagen Beetle. They no, actually... They, in fact, in this, they don't refer to... They don't use the word Volkswagen until a third film in the series. Mm, it's called they The only, Little Car. They call it The Little Car. And I, I actually read about the audition process for oh, Herbie. Yeah, it's cute, they, right? They, they didn't know what model of car Herbie was going to be, so they this living car so they bought brought down a bunch of different cars and they brought out all the riders like well which car do you think it should be and they just started looking at the cars and they they went up to the cars and they would like kick the tires and slam the doors and sit down and see how it drove and then they went up to the volkswagen beetle and they started petting it <laughs> like, oh, it's round and cute it's like yeah, yeah we're gonna go for the, the round cute car it, it makes uh, a lot mm. of sense uh the Love Bug was not the original title. Again, the car, the book was called Car Boy Girl. Mm-hmm. It was like some sort of like it's love triangle, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but amongst the titles that they considered and didn't go for <laughs> were the Magic Volksy. Mm, okay. The Runaway Wagen. The the Runaway. Okay. It probably would, it was spelled with an E, so yeah. it would have been like Wagen. W a g e n. Yeah. Uh, Beetle Bomb. Okay, I would have loved to have seen Beetle Bomb. Wonder Beetle. Uh huh. Bug Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a wrestling move. And Thunderbug, which I quite oh, like Thunderbug. Thunderbug. Thunderbug sounds fun, right? I'm going to call it Thunderbug from now on. <laughs> In any case, they settled on mm-hmm. the Love Bug, and history was made. Herbie right. the Love Bug actually has only been in only like so many movies but he's one of the most recognizable live action Disney creations. Yeah. People just like the idea of yeah. a cute little Volkswagen Beetle that wants you to that wants you to help you date and likes and racing. Al- and also likes racing. Well, it, it's one of those rare things like uh, a lot of people like to point to Pokémon and its success because uh, it can appeal to essentially little boys and little girls. Mm-hmm. Pokemon, you know, uh, little boys who are probably into more action or violence uh, want to see animals fighting each other, and they want to see the superpowers. But they're also cute, and you can collect them. Mm-hmm. So you know, the, it has these two sort of uh, elements so at this is, play. This is a sports movie, so and it's a rom-com. It's, it's a sports movie and a romance. Everybody likes both sports and romance movies. You get a little bit of both. Uh, I think what's interesting about Herbie the Love Bug as a character before we, we <laughs> get in, because he has a character. Yeah. He, he has agency. Mm-hmm. He has things that he wants. Herbie the Love Bug, and, and it was actually my wife pointed this out to me, Michelle. She was mm-hmm. a big fan of Herbie movies as a kid, and we watched them all together. Oh, yeah. Uh, rewatched them recently. Um, she pointed out Herbie's got a, like a consciousness, but Herbie is a kid. 
<laughs> Herbie is like a kid, and Herbie like looks at Dean Jones. Herbie wants a dad, and when Dean Jones rejects the car because he doesn't believe mm. that it's like actually a person, Herbie like runs away uh-huh. like a kid, and Dean Jones has to track it down mm. like a kid. It's like any of those movies where like kids have a divorced parent and they're trying to hook them up with somebody. Like That's Herbie, the, like the Parent Trap, for like, instance, which was also a very popular <laughs> Disney movie yeah. at the time. Uh, there's a great scene. I think my favorite scene in any Herbie movie. And it's real simple. It's real sweet. Not mm. much going on to it. It's in the second one. Herbie rides again. When Herbie, Herbie has a tendency to, when two people who he thinks should be in love are in the car, mm. to hijack them. Yeah. And they Dri- roll drive, the drive them to Lover's Lane, essentially. Yeah, drive them to Lover's Lane. In Herbie Rides Again, he drives them to the beach. Mm. And then the two lovers in Herbie Rides Again, they're just having a little moment. And we cut to Herbie, and Herbie is just like driving around on the sand, like chasing seagulls. <laughs> it's so adorable. <laughs> Because you know Herbie would do that. Mm. And Herbie doesn't mean anything by it. Herbie's just playing. Yeah. Like, that's Herbie. That's I, Herbie in a nutshell, that scene for me. I always thought saw Herbie as kind of like a particularly smart dog. Mm. Like, he, he understands the needs of his owner, but he's not so sophisticated that he has many needs beyond, the, like, the most basic. Well, I think he's a... Mat- also, also, he's a car. That's my point. Is I think he's, like, a child. <laughs> okay. I think he's, he, he understands basic concepts of things, but he doesn't have a lot of nuanced philosophies. Right. Just kind of has his goals. Um, so, the first, The Love Bug... Like 19, 1968 it came out yeah, stars great score no great oh my god the herbie theme is like the best driving theme ever because it's a driving theme it's like do 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 but up but up ah yeah yeah I don't even know i think you're it's, way off key in that whole well, of course whatever okay but uh regardless put on the herbie the love bug theme and just drive around and like i don't care if there's traffic this is nice <laughs> it's just this cheerful little tune uh dean jones plays a race car driver he's not very good buddy hackett uh, the great comedian Buddy Hackett plays uh, his best friend. Buddy Hackett has a weird character in this because he's not just the comic relief sidekick. He's also into Eastern mysticism. And we find out that like he did like this whole retreat mm. to Tibet with like the Dalai Lama where he learned about animism. Yeah. The belief that inanimate objects have personalities and lives of their own. You knew that some, like, some cultural phenomenon was definitely right on the outside of being cool by the time it had leaked down into a Disney live action yeah. film. So, like, the, the wave of it Eastern mysticism real now. was, yeah, it was all, already passed. It was harmless enough that Disney could put, because they're never going to do anything, like, daring or edgy. Yeah. Uh, in any case, uh, Dean Jones loses his latest race, doesn't have a car, uh, and he spies a very attractive lady in the window of a car dealership, lady played by Michelle Lee, who is great in this movie. Yeah. And he goes in, and her boss, played by... The incredible David Tomlinson. <laughs> From Mary Poppins. Yeah, he was the dad and in ben, Mary Poppins. And Bob's and Broomsticks as well. Yeah, he is so good mm. at playing a stuck-up British guy. <laughs> That's why you hire him. If I could have nominated him for an Academy Award for The Love Bug, I would. <laughs> he gives the perfect comedic performance. He's everything you need him to be in this mm. movie. And then some. Why did you make him so cruel? <laughs> um... He finds out he's in possession of a little car, a little Volkswagen. Mm. Beat up. Old lady, I guess, passed away, and the the car ended up here. Mm. Uh, I, think, you, I think the implication is that it's her soul in the car. I don't think it is, because the car's name is Herbie. Well, I thought it was the impression Buddy, it was like Buddy her ha- kid. Buddy Hackett names the car Herbie, but yeah. maybe it's an old lady. Uh, we find out in a future film that Herbie is actually its name. Like, officially, it's like on a plate in the car. Well, that's, that's a little bit of retconning, but yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about <laughs> the controversial... Peyton Reed, The Love Bug, starring Bruce Campbell from the director of Ant-Man, and they make some very daring... And, perhaps, and, and Down With Love. Yes, some very daring and dark choices about the Herbie The Love Bug stories. <laughs> they, they bury the car. It's like so funny. <laughs> the car dies. We'll, we'll, talk, we'll, talk about, we'll talk about it. We'll, talk, we'll get there all in a minute. Right, all right. Dean Jones buys, ends up taking the car off of their hands, but the uh, car is alive! And no one believes him, and he thinks they're trying to play a trick on him. And he runs afoul of David Tomlinson, and they end up challenging each other to a race. Dean Jones and Herbie, together, are a great racing team. Herbie mm. does most of the work. <laughs> but well, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, because Herbie can hijack anybody. Yeah. So if somebody gets in and like steps on the brake, sometimes it doesn't work. Henry, Henry, yeah. Henry Herbie can push past that. Yeah. And I think it's I think it's a matter of when, uh, so the, when driver, can, can a driver and car are working together in harmony. Uh-huh. 
they're better than they would be individually. There's a, they talk right. about this a lot in Herbie Fully Loaded. Yeah. Where Herbie in there is trying to be more like its owner. Mm. And, and when does, they're does working like together, tr- tr- what's best? Tricks he learns from his owner. And exactly. That sort of thing. Um, Dean Jones, and again, a little Volkswagen Beetle, which can like pop wheelies and go at like 250 <laughs> miles an hour. Like, he just becomes the toast of the racing circuit. And he doesn't believe that Herbie is real. Uh, Buddy Hackett believes it's real. Mm. Uh, eventually, uh, Dean Jones' girlfriend believes it's real. Even David Tomlinson thinks something is up. <laughs> but Dean Jones refuses to believe it, and finally he like just cracks and says, It's just a car! That's all it is! Mm. And he realizes in the middle of this huge scene where he's just yelling at the car that he's wrong and it's real. And, and it's Herbie, getting sad. And Herbie runs away, Aww. and there's this great... It's a gorgeously filmed sequence where Dean so Jones look, is running looking, through San Francisco. Looking for Herbie. Yeah, yes. in the San Francisco fog, and it's beautifully lit. And he finds Herbie about to kill himself. <laughs> he's hanging off. Off a bridge, and he's trying to stop the car from killing himself. And you're just like, "Holy no. shit, Disney!" It, it was a more innocent time. You could was, you, you could joke about throwing yourself off a bridge more. It's a car, time, so it's yeah. still absurd. Also, it's like, a car. It's, yeah. it's super weird. Uh, the car ends up in possession of a Chinese businessman, and the Chinese businessman teams up with Dean Jones, yada, 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 yada. There's they, a big they win, race. They win the race, and he gets the girl. But it's a huge race. The race that's is true, great. It's true. a long race. takes place over a couple of days. David Tomlinson is, like, snidely whiplash. Mm-hmm. He's, like, drinking champagne when he thinks he's finally destroyed Herbie. Like, that kind of thing. Oh. And there's a bit where David Tomlinson doesn't realize that his sidekick didn't make it into a car, and his sidekick has been replaced by a bear. <laughs> yeah. And that bear is great. <laughs> that bear is just as scared as David Tomlinson is as they're driving around. Who is driving? Oh, no, bear is driving. How can that be? It ends in this great sequence where Herbie gets cut in half, oh. and Herbie comes in first in the race and third. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a great little bit. It's a fun little stunt. Everyone's like hiding out course, in half a car. Now you're wondering, wh- wh- is Herbie's soul in both of those halves, or yes. did it move to one half? No, it's in both. If you were to cut Herbie it, into 20 pieces. The back each... half is working in separately. Okay. It, it's it's going off in its own autonomous direction. The motor is in the back, though. The motor of, is in the back. Really makes beetle. you think. Yeah. Really makes you think. Mm-hmm. Herbie the Love Bug, the original, <laughs> the original Love Bug, is a great little movie. It's 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 really charming. Completely it's really sweet. delightful. The worst you can say about it, and it's a legit critique. And if you want to, this totally holds you back from it. I totally get it. Uh, it's depiction of the Chinese characters is a little on the racist side. Uh, it's not no. as racist as you might think. And boy, is that damning with faint praise. But it's, it's, it's just, not. It's not as racist as Buddy Hackett has been on stage. <laughs> that is for damn sure. It's just whenever like the Chinese characters are on stage, they'll like do some terrible pun. You mm. don't have egg on your face. You have egg foo young on your face. Mm. Ha yeah, ha ha! Yeah. Wasn't funny then either. I'm, I, I wasn't alive. Let me tell you something. Wasn't funny. I can tell you that right wasn't now. Funny in '68. It's a stupid it's not, joke. There's nothing hateful about it. It's just it's stupid funny and reductive. Years later, yeah. It's stupid and reductive. And boy, does that suck. But it's actually only like a couple of moments in an otherwise very sweet film. Yeah. And I like the Love Bug a lot. Do you Her- like Do you like Herbie Rides Again? I mostly do. Right. There's Her- things Herbie- I don't like about it. Yeah, Herbie Rides Again came out in '74. It's mm-hmm. still, um, it's still. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh no, it's not Dean Jones anymore. It's New Lovers. Dean Jones yeah, comes back later. Dean Jones is in Europe, I believe. Mm. He is, no, I think he's in uh, Brazil or something. He's he's traveling the world. Yeah, with, with, Buddy with his new bride. The world. Yeah, uh, and uh, the, Herbie is now staying with Buddy Hackett's mother. Yeah, uh, who is played by Helen Hayes? Helen Hayes, the great yeah. Helen Hayes. Is Helen in this Hayes, one. The, mm. the dame of the stage and screen. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think. What was it? Oh god! And, and she, she's not his mom. I think she's like his aunt or something. She's like mom but, yeah. or grandmother. Um, but yeah, she uh, she has a pretty neighbor, and the main character is uh, b- 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 is actually the uh, the nephew mm. of an evil billionaire who's trying to build the biggest building in the world, played by Keenan Wynn. Keenan Wynn, his character is named Alonzo Hawk. Which is a great bad guy and, name. And he plays the same bad guy in The Absent-Minded Professor and in Son of Flubber. I did not know that. Yeah, which I believe Shit, are... we should have watched those. Which I think are part of the... The medfield uh, The medfield verse. Yeah. Bef- people don't know this. Mm. Before the idea of a shared universe was popular, there were a few that kind of flew under the radar and no one talked about them. A lot of people know about the Universal Monster Verse. Mm. We've talked about it on this podcast before already when we did um, uh, the House, House, House of Frankenstein. House of Dracula. Yeah. House of uh, Frankenstein. House of Frankenstein. Um, 
Another one was the Medfield uh, movies, which were a series of live-action films produced by Disney, which all kind of took place in and around the same town, the same college. Uh, Medfield, and, Medfield, the fictional Medfield College. Yeah, so you so had stuff had, like... Um, now You See Him, Now You Don't, uh-huh. uh, Strongest Man in the World, yep. uh, and The Computer Wore Tennis Shoes, uh, and The Barefoot Executive. Those ones yep. all had uh, uh, Kurt Russell yeah. as the and, same character. And then you had uh, the Absent Mind Professor movies, mm. and I guess Herbie is tangentially sort of Be- in there as well. Because of Keenan Wynn, they, they, they all... I digress. Keenan Wynn plays Alonzo Hawk. He's trying to build this huge building, and it turns out the only building that hasn't sold to him yet... Is owned by Buddy Hackett's mother, grandmother, Aunt, Aunt's relative. Buddy Hackett's relative, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Steinmetz. Mm-hmm. She is interesting because she introduces, or at least codifies, what's really going on with Herbie. Mm-hmm. There's a couple of theories in the first film about how Herbie is, uh, uh, you know, people just love him a lot and he became alive. Mm. Mrs. Steinmetz clarifies that this is a universe in which animism is real, and she has a lot of inanimate objects in her house, which are people. She has, mm-hmm. like, a, like a, a, a record player, which is a person. She has, like, an old, like, trolley from, like, the San Francisco trolley yeah, system uh, in old, her backyard. Old 22. Yeah, like, that, that's a person as well. Mm. She has a couple of things right now. And, and she just sort of accepts this as true. Mm-hmm. And you can prove it really easily. <laughs> and Herbie's been staying with her while Dean I, Jones has been out and about. This is one of those things where the filmmakers are clearly giving a little too much thought to the mechanics of this. Because I think people who are watching Herbie are asking these questions. So if they're going to make a sequel, they just have to embrace it. Mm-hmm. It's like, now the world knows there's a living car. Well, now we just have to kind of expand on that if we're going to continue to tell this story. So yeah, now there's living everything. This is another conceit that they'll forget as we go on. We don't run into many like other uh, sentient cars or other sentient objects outside of this film. Yeah, um, until we get to Horace. No, no, we do. Look, uh, Herbie uh, goes to Monte Carlo has one as well. We'll talk about oh, that yeah, in a I minute. Guess so, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so this this starts getting really, really broad, and by the end of it, he's calling in like an army of Volkswagen Beetles mm. to solve the problem. Yeah, but basically, this is boils down to we have to get the land away from the old lady. And there's a series of misadventures as Alonzo Hawk's nephew, uh, play, not, um, played by not Tommy Kirk, played by not, uh, played by not uh, Dean I'm Jones. Up. Ken Barry is the actor's name. Okay, yeah, Ken Barry, who has really, uh, he's a charming young actor at this time. Really hairy hands. <laughs> I, I just found him really hey. distracting. He's just got very hairy, hairy hands, like so. super hairy, like mm. super hairy hands. Just no, all right. No, this, found it a little distracting sometimes. This is the one where Herbie gets to sneak around on like a window ledge. There's a window ledge big on enough, a skyscraper, and Herbie manages a to, wagon beetle. to drive around and chase Keenan Wynn around. That he that is a recipe for death. <laughs> this one gets really really weird because there's a bunch of like fantasy sequences. Where Keenan Wynn oh, like yeah. has nightmares about Herbie. Herbie like there's a whole bunch of Herbies. Herbie and, like, has like fangs. Herbie at has one fangs point. Yeah. in the hood as the hood opens up. Herbie also is at this point in this sequence uh, dressed like stereotypical Native American Indians and throwing tomahawks mm. at Keenan Wynn. So a little that's, bit more racism. That, that's not offensive at all. No. Yes, it's a little. It's a, it's a mm. bit offensive. It's not. The, it's a very small part of a larger movie, but it's in there, yeah. and you're gonna have to deal with that. Um, 1974 yeah. was a different time. You know, it's it's a uh, it's a much sillier film, but it's got so many imaginative moments, like Herbie just like riding along on those giant like rails at the top of the Golden Gate Bridge, mm. just driving. Like, that's a gorgeous image. It's so think, pretty, so fun. It, it, it's gorgeous. It's imaginative, but it lost sight of the point, which is he's a love bug. Yeah, and when you take the romance element and the racing element the two things that Herbie's good at out of a Herbie movie, you're left with something a little too kiddified, a little too kid friendly. Yeah. Which is a strange thing to say. I know about a Disney film well, about a living let's car. Let's talk about that a couple on a couple of different levels. First off, uh, he does actually end up helping, uh, Alonzo Hawk's nephew, uh, fall for Mrs. Steinmetz, like niece the, or something the, like yeah, that. The, um, so there, he does the, actually help people fall in love in this movie, but yeah, the racing is gone. You mentioned that like, you know, you're making it real kid friendly. What I think is really odd about the Kirby, uh, the Herbie movies is that they are obviously appealing to the kids. It's a lovable yeah. little car. The car acts like a kid. The car acts like, you know. Well, and it comes from a company who's t- tends to make films for kids. So, there's yeah. there's a, the only Herbie movie in which the protagonist is a little kid is Herbie Goes Bananas. Mm. It's always about adults or in yeah. the case of Herbie Full Loaded, teenagers. But like it's never about little kids. 
It's about adults with adult until problems. We get, yeah, until, <laughs> until we get, yeah, to the... It's very strange. Oh, God, I forgot his name. The, the oh, little, the little uh, kid from Herbie Goes Bananas. I'll, I'll look we'll, get, we'll get to him because we have another film before we get yeah, to Herbie The next film is Herbie Goes to Monte Carlo from Dur- 1977. Directed by Vincent McAviti. Yes, who did a lot did of classic everything. TV. everything. A lot did, of classic TV. He, um... In particular. Oh. Uh, this one re- has the return of Dean Jones. Buddy Hackett isn't back. He is replaced as the comedy sidekick by Don Knotts. Mm-hmm. Don Knotts in this movie. A move up, I would say. Well, I would say that, except I hate his character. Oh, okay. Don Knotts' <laughs> character in Herbie Goes to Monte Carlo. And the plot of Herbie Goes to Monte Carlo is, is Herbie, Herbie Goes, goes to, to Monte, Monte Carlo. Carlo. To race at Monte Carlo. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's the whole plot, basically. Well, th- well, it gets stupid, but that's all we need to get started with. Don Knotts... Plays a virulent misogynist. Yeah. He hates women. And he talks about how, like, all the women in his life, like, walked out on him or kicked him out of the house. And so mm-hmm. when Herbie falls in love with a car uh, that is being raced by uh, one of the few female racers uh-huh. of the time, um, and the car turns out to also be a person, uh, Don Knotts. Will have none of this. <laughs> and when an opportunity comes along to wreck Herbie's relationship mm. by feeding both Herbie and this Lancia, this car that he's in love with, uh. to feed it lies about how the other person in the relationship hates That's them. 1976 Lancia Scorpion. I'm looking that up right he now. He leaps at that chance. He is sadistic and cruel. Mm. It is a weird performance from Don Knotts because Don Knotts is known as one of the most likable comedic actors ever. He's just hapless and bumbling and charming and he here he's mean. Yeah, it's a weird performance, and a movie that's otherwise is, is perfectly harmless. Um, the the plot kicks in when uh, as they're doing the big intro uh, with with Herbie as uh-huh. they're introducing all the cars. Uh, there is a museum heist, and a couple of bumbling uh, uh, criminals steal a giant diamond, and they hide the diamond in Herbie's gas tank. And now they're trying to chase Herbie around Europe, mm. trying to get the diamond out of the gas tank. That's the basic gist of it. And, and Herbie knows it's in there, but can't get it out because it's stuck in the gas tank. Like, much like Air Bud before him, Herbie can only go a couple <laughs> of films before heists have to be injected into the story. It's never just enough that Herbie is racing. It's but always got to have heists. Herbie is, oh, I would love to see like some sort of test you know, as to how intelligent Herbie... Like, Herbie tries to build his own car. His own That's little, weird. His own little baby. That's actually weird. Well, I mean, cars don't mate. They have to build themselves. It's still an so odd thing to sort of bring to, up. Tries to make a little baby car. That's and then a, there's a weird baby, thing. a little baby Herbie. The weird, thing I started, cute. the weird thing I started noticing in Herbie Goes to Monte Carlo, and this is this is persistent in all the other Herbie movies to come. Mm. The premise of Herbie the Love Bug is that Herbie is, after the first film, a world-famous novelty car. Yeah. Like he's a Volkswagen well, Beetle. That's a that's a powerful racing car. He's a world famous racing car, and yet the premise of every subsequent movie from this one on is was, he's world famous and nobody knows him. Well nobody knows him, and in fact he's like found in junk shops and stuff. And people say, Hey, wait a minute, that's that Where, car. It's how like, did he who let that car out of their sight? That car is important. Yeah, that car should be in a museum at well, least. I I guess I understand if you look at like famous pieces of art. It's like this is a famous but like during a war, maybe like a famous painting will be like, mm. like squirreled away in somebody's basement or but it's somebody only doesn't a know what it, years somebody later. Does, like a soldier doesn't know what it is and he steals it and it's just in a guy's this, apartment this for isn't decades. A, this you isn't know? a two hundred year old Vermeer. This is a car that was famous last year. <laughs> it's, it's true. It's and, a, and especially when from Monte Carlo onward, a lot of the characters are into racing. And they they would and know about Herbie. They would have at least like, oh, isn't it interesting? There's a mm. Volkswagen Beetle that can pop wheelies and go mm. two hundred fifty miles an hour. Um, That's Wait, that's happened before. How do I know that? <laughs> there would at least be that moment. Like, oh, that sounds so familiar um, to me. Eric Braden is in this film, mm. along with a uh, few other notable like British character actors like Roy Kinnear and Bernard Fox. Um, it's great to see all of these sort of like international stars together in this kind of goofy race film. Herbie is the whole franchise is just this wonderful, wonderful excuse for comedic side actors to get work. <laughs> That's Pretty basically much. it. If you were if you were a, like a comedy actor, a guy who shows up as like the third or fourth lead in something goes, "What?" Yeah. Herbie was a gift to you. <laughs> you just got to look at that car and go, "What? Oh my god!" And like every my, scene is gold. Where's my monocle? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the tagline was: "The love bug turns the great race into a Herbie Derby." <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm going to say that again because I like to. Herpy Derby. Nice. Uh, there is... Then we go fast forward to 1980. No, oh, wait, hold on. I, I want to give oh, a little to, bit okay. of credit out uh, to a small actor named Xavier St. Macquarie. Okay. I'm probably mispronouncing his name. He was from France. Uh, he steals ha- this movie. Javier. He steals this movie as the sheriff of uh, the sheriff, the, uh, uh, the chief of police's kind of bumbling sidekick. Because it turns out the chief of police is behind the bank heist. And he's actually trying to like prevent Herbie from uh, okay. getting away. And he's got this bumbling sidekick. He looks like a young Sasha Baron Cohen. He's so happy <laughs> oh, right, right, all the guy. time. He's yeah. super cheerful at everything. And he just comes in, and you can never be mad at him, no matter how much he screwed up your plans. And he just immediately, I took it upon myself to do this thing that would screw up your plans if you stole the diamond. But of course you didn't do that, did you, sir? Did no. you? No. Yeah, I didn't no, think I didn't. so. <clears throat> But he's really, 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 really funny in this, and he's my favorite part of the film. All right. Um, the next film is Herbie Goes Bananas, and from this point on, Herbie would hibernate for a bit. Well, I mean, 1980 was not kind to the world. Uh, <laughs> a lot of horrible things happened in 1980 in, in the film world. Uh, one of them was Herbie Goes Bananas. Kind of like... It's- the first properly bad Herbie movie. Well, Bar- this one, it's Herbie had, focused and weird. Herbie had a, a charm to him throughout this in the sixties and throughout the seventies. Mm. You could get behind this notion of a, a cute little car. Um, I guess by nineteen eighty, the Volkswagen Beagle Beetle wasn't Beagle. <laughs> Charles Darwin drove it. Um, it was. Uh, had become popular and then it had become unpopular. And I think the notion of making a, a film about a 1968 Volkswagen Beetle was like, what do you watch a car today? A uh, car film today about like a Geo Metro? Like what's the what's the <laughs> I lamest, answer. That what's the funny. lamest possible car you can think That's, of? That's a Geo Metro is like, pretty good. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's like it's pretty good. It's like a living Geo Metro. Yeah, I'm trying to make it look like hip and cool. Well, I guess irony is everywhere now, so it would work. But, but, but was, Herbie was a punchline at this point. Herbie yeah. was, you couldn't take a Herbie movie seriously, so they kind of didn't bother mm. with Herbie Goes Bananas. Herbie Goes Bananas uh, is... Also Vincent uh, McAviti. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it is about Herbie, a couple of years later, has been abandoned in Mexico for some reason. You know what? This is actually true to history. A lot of Volkswagen Beetles, they were such reliable cars, but they were really unpopular, that uh, Volkswagen started not just shipping American Volkswagens that they had bought back, but uh, were manufacturing Volkswagen Beetles for use as taxi cabs in Latin America. Again, Uh, he's a famous car. He's a famous car, but he's just a Volkswagen Beetle at this point that nobody cares about anymore. If you don't think it's alive, you're just going to sell it. Uh, In fact, I I had looked this up when I was first watching these movies a couple years back. Uh, the Volkswagen Type 1 was in production until 2005. Oh, that was a very popular car. But uh, they stopped producing it in America, like, start distri- stopped distributing it in America, like, sometime in the 80s. Yeah, it was a while. But, uh, I remember it was a big deal when they came back with the new design. Yeah, but they, ke- they, came, they kept on making them in because they were so popular as just reliable taxicabbed cars. Yeah. And when the last one was made in 2005, that was a big deal. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so what happens is Jim Douglas finds out Herbie is there and he sends his nephew, uh, played by Stephen W. Burns, uh, and his nephew's best friend, DJ, played by Charles Martin Smith, who directed Directed Air Air (laughs) Bud. Which is awesome. They have to go retrieve the car. He was also uh, in, in Mexico. He was also never cry wolf. He was in Starman. He's he been in, around. He's been in yeah. the Untouchables. He's had a hell of a career. Yeah. It raises the question: Who would win in a race, Herbie or mm-hmm. Airbud, driving a car? Uh, well, ain't no rule says a dog can't drive a car. I didn't say there was. They were gonna race. It would have to be a dog car. <laughs> like a, a, a dog a, car. A car made for a dog. I, I can't see Air Bud like strapping blocks to his they feet gave, so he can they reach gave the pedals. Air Bud shoulder pads when he played football. The rules don't apply. <laughs> but he's still running on his feet. He can't it's drive. Fine. A dog can't drive a car, sir. There's no rule that says a dog can't drive a car. <laughs> Herbie would win that race. You think Herbie would win that yeah. race? I think it would. I think they would Air, literally Air, tie. You think so? I think it would literally come mm. down to a nose and, like, everybody just, like, runs to the front of the car and boom, mm. nose, tie. Her- Herbie would win because there was a bomb in Air Bud's car that he didn't know about. Oh, God. And Air Bud had to leap out at the last minute. There's a big heist. And you then don't they, understand. Skid over, they skid over the finish line and Herbie pops his front truck and there's a bunch of puppies inside that he was keeping safe. Oh. <laughs> anyway, these guys, they pick up Herbie, but they, uh, they run afoul of a young pickpocket named oh. Paco. Uh, who's, Paco. Paco That's his steals name. their wallet. The character's name. Paco yeah. steals their wallet, but he also steals the wallet of John Vernon, great character mm. actor John Vernon, <laughs> uh, who you may recall from Animal House. 
Uh, he put them on double super secret probation. Yeah. John Vernon uh, has microfilm in his wallet that will help him find Aztec gold. God. And Paco steals that. And Paco ends up befriending Herbie, and Herbie and Paco go on the run. John Vernon is weirdly intense in this movie. Like, I just he's, rewatched it. He's just he's playing the role that was given him. But like, he's taking looking, it seriously. You look at, like, David Tomlinson is playing, like, a funny version of it. Keenan Wynn is playing a funny version of it. John Vernon actually scares me in this movie. <laughs> John Vernon, it's like, John Vernon will shoot me in the face if I steal his wallet. Like, that's uh, what I'm genuinely afraid of. Uh, I, I don't like Paco. I mean, just the, the in, uh, infusing a little kid into this is just not we don't, wise because tur- like, the kid can't drive well the kid's Kirby not does inter- all the driving well, so I understand fine. but you know he's not interested in racing he's not a gearhead he doesn't care about the car he just thinks it's cute and he can talk to it and it kind of beeps words at him he calls him Ocho because it's the number 53 on the back and that like, adds why, up to the number 8 why he doesn't call him 53 I don't know I don't know my thing with Paco is this Paco doesn't want anything that's the thing. That's the thing that bothers me. He's, I'm okay with having like a kid protagonist in a kid's movie. Why wouldn't I be? It makes sense. Mm-hmm. you got to make sure there's a reason for the kid to be there. The other Herbie movies, Herbie was the kid. He was trying to help adults do things. Mm-hmm. Here, we have a kid. How is Herbie going to connect to that kid? Is Herbie going to be like the father? The kid doesn't really ask for that. The kid All doesn't right. want that. Kids, kids just serve him as like their friend. And they just go off on adventures and they hang out. Neither of them are getting anything out of this. Herbie doesn't do any love bugging in this. <laughs> There's a whole subplot with these two, like, you know, dweebs. Lo- who love, pick up- love bugging is a great <laughs> disco hit from 1974. The two dweebs end up, like, taking Herbie onto a cruise ship with the great Harvey Corman as the captain who thinks he's Captain Bly. <laughs> he just has these frilled okay. hats and Harvey, Harvey Corman, yells about everything. Harvey Corman has been in a huge fistful of garbage. Yes, he has. He, he has participated in some really 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 horrible things the star wars holiday special. star wars holiday special maybe be the worst maybe the worst thing ever done by a human he being. he has not lost my respect never he always sells it <laughs> he always sells he it always goes for 110 percent, and he is going for it in this in this movie and he is matched rather well uh, by cloris leachman equally legendary cloris leachman holy shit cloris leachman is great <laughs> and she's in love with harvey corman harvey corman is only in love with the sea and together <laughs> Together they run afoul of Herbie the Love Bug, who is like driving and skidding all over the the boat trying to save Paco from being captured as a stowaway. There's a scene where Harvey Corman makes Herbie walk the plank. And Herbie, they try to kill Herbie. And Herbie like flows in through the Panama Canal. And Herbie almost dies. And they have to like try to save Herbie. You know, I heard for a long time that Volkswagen Beetles were watertight. They're not. But uh, that they were light enough that they would float you a good distance before sinking entirely. And in various Herbie films... I think films, by a, di- a good distance, they meant maybe 10 feet, but yeah. they're, they're kind of playing with that. In, in, her, in the Disney movies, Herbie has skipped across the water like a thrown stone. Mm. Uh, he has swum across the water, oh. uh, which just like his, like, you know, the cabin above the waves. He is, I think he's driven at the bottom of the waves as mm. well. Uh he just Water drives is, out of a lake. I, I assume he needs to be reupholstered after a while. He's going to mildew. But other than that, <laughs> I guess he's fine. Anyway, so that's he, what the next Herbie film will be about. He's reached old age. He retains with Paco. They accidentally or intentionally, I'm actually hazy on it, kidnap Harvey Corman and Cloris Leachman, and then Herbie drives them into the middle of a bullfighting ring where oh, Herbie God. fights a bull. This is I, I have saw problems this on, with that. But I okay. saw this on TV when I was a kid, and that's like my first memory of Herbie the Love Bug. A lot of Her- people said this Herbie, was their first yeah, Herbie movie. Herbie fight, like bullfighting, and Paco sitting in the front seat going toro toro, and he's flipping his his front trunk up and up and down, waving a red flag, and uh. it's not great. Anyway, there's this big fight. Where Herbie is trying to take down an airplane. It's like the ending of the movie Charlie Varick. <laughs> which, if you haven't seen Charlie Varick, it's so good. It's one of the best hard boiled crime movies starring Walter Matthau ever, and that's saying something. Yeah, he was in a lot of those. He was. Take Impella 1, 2, 3. I, I haven't seen Hopscotch yet, but I, uh, I have it in my home. Anyway, Charlie Varick is great. Herbie basically does the ending of Charlie Varick, where he's like jumping off of things at the plane, and it's actually kind of cool to look at. <laughs> but it all ends reasonably happy. And blah 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 blah. blah, 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 blah. It's okay. not a good movie. Her, this was the lowest grossing Herbie movie by far. Herbie, it's the worst Herbie movie by I far. I would argue that as the well. TV movie. Oh yeah, but and Herbie kind of disappeared from theaters for uh, almost twenty years. But, but he, he showed up on the Wonderful World of Disney a lot. There was 
a five episode Herbie the Love Bug television series in 1982. Now, on critically acclaimed, we only review movies. We did. Oh. We got to do the movies. If it's fe- feature length, we'll review it. If it's part of a franchise, we're not going to do a TV series. We've already talked about that. However. Because Herbie the Love Bug was only five episodes and was canceled after its mid-season replacement <laughs> run, we are reviewing on the next upcoming episode of our other podcast, Cancelled Too Soon, mm-hmm. all Her- five episodes of Herbie the Love, of Herbie Bug. The Love Bug. So, if you TV really series. want to find out more about Herbie the Love Bug, the TV series in which Dean Jones returned, uh huh, we will review it there. Mm. So, so stick around; that will come out like next Wednesday, I think. Um, meanwhile. Mm. Time goes by. Time Herbie, goes by. Herbie is you know, remembered fondly, but not so much that Disney decided to bring Herbie back. Herbie did like a couple of like I think he showed up on TV well, every once in a while as like a sketch or I something. I think you could go. I think you could go. There was a time when you could have gone to Disneyland and sat in Herbie. Like you could have oh, your picture taken cool. with Herbie. I know Universal. You could do that with Kit. Yeah. Um, from Knight Rider, and I think the. I it's weird to recall the, that you could do that with Herbie. It's like weird at some that there was no the Herbie ride. It's, Autopia could become a Herbie ride so easily. Well, uh, keep in mind, Herbie was waning in popularity. I, but I think for 15 years of, or so, he was well, very yeah, popular. That's, true. that's my point. He was still, he's still a well loved cons- character. And consider he's also a Volkswagen. I imagine yeah. they'd have to get you know, all kinds of legal permission to get, you know, use right, that's probably like, true. actual Volkswagens in a, right. a ride. Meanwhile, in 1997, so 17 years yep. after Herbie Goes Bananas, they decided to do a TV movie. In which Herbie returns. It's called The Love Bug. Mm-hmm. It's directed by Peyton Reed, the director of Ant-Man and Down with Love mm-hmm. and a bunch of other fun movies as well. It stars Bruce Campbell as a down-on-his-luck racer who's now working as a mechanic. Who somehow stumbles upon the dejected Herbie. Well, <laughs> not somehow. It's actually like it's actually reasonably well thought out, this one. Although, mm-hmm. it does a huge retcon on Herbie's origin. Because <laughs> this is all about Herbie's origin. Yeah, this so this, one. One, this one's considered part of the canon, but it really takes serious liberties with Herbie's history. Mm-hmm. So... Bruce Campbell enters a competition, and the competition is a bunch of mechanics go in, and they're given total junkers. The junkers yeah. are one of the junkers is Herbie the Love Bug, and you have like one day to fix the car and get it in fight and shape so it can just do one lap around when, the track. When did NASCAR start? Because um, that, that I don't know actually. Yeah, um, I'm not. A, I'm, not an I'm looking up that. NASCAR, Look but that. That, the, the whole notion with NASCAR, you know, stock car, stock yeah. car racing, which means not built for racing things that were sort of modified actual yeah. model cars that were be- that became uh, race cars well you look that up in and any yeah, case Bruce sure. Campbell ends up with Herbie who had recently been purchased by a villain named, played by John Hanna wonderful the, John Hanna from the Mummy movies like the mm-hmm. Brendan Fraser series and Four Weddings and a Funeral and Sliding Doors which is really underrated um yeah He's the jerk racer who bought Herbie because he had seen Herbie do amazing things. He actually knew who Herbie was. Mm. But then Herbie wouldn't do anything for him because he's a jerk. So he threw Mm. Herbie away. Bruce Campbell fixes him up. Herbie ends up popping a wheelie in front of everybody and impressing the shit out of everyone. Everyone goes, cars, like, like Mm. a a Volkswagen Beetle shouldn't be able to do that. Mm. And we're talking about people who, like, work for racing magazines who would probably know a little bit about Herbie. So that's uh, strange credulity, but what are you going to do? Oh, you know what? Uh, NASCAR was founded in 1948. Yeah, so, I thought so you never were off I think it got more popular in the 90s, but still, it, was, yeah. it had been around for forever. Um, anyway, Bruce Campbell ends up in possession of the car. He wins the car. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, oh, what's the guy's name? The guy who's in all of Stephen Summers' films. Kevin J. So, O'Connor. Oh, Kevin J. O'Connor. Is, Kevin yeah, J. O'Connor so plays the Buddy Hackett role. Uh-huh. Uh, he's the one who believes that Herbie is real. In fact, there's a lot of elements they grandfather in from the original Herbie movie, like the comedy sidekick also likes making like art out of car parts. That's in there too. The uh, and the love interest who like they kind of hate each other at first, but Herbie hijacks them and drives them to romantic location. Exactly. It's 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 almost a loose remake. Yeah. But what happens is John Hanna realizes that he gave away the car. The car works for Bruce Campbell. What the hell? And he mm. manages to track down the guy who designed Herbie. And here's where it gets weird. The guy who designed Herbie is a German scientist, not unlike Stanley Tucci's character from Captain America the First Avenger, <laughs> who had been who had helped design the Volkswagen Beetle in the first place. But after the war and he was being interrogated by American generals, he was trying to explain the idea of the people's wagon. Uh-huh. And the that got lost in translation, and they thought he had created a car that could think like a person, and they told him to make that. And after a few years, he accidentally knocked over a picture of his dead wife in the vat of alloy, and his love for his wife gave birth to a car that likes love. So it's exactly like Child's Play 3. <laughs> 
sure. where Charles Lee Ray's blood drips into the plastic that molds into a new Chucky doll, and that's the thing that is now possessed. Uh, kind of. Like, like, they it's destroyed the old weird. one, but now there's a new one. So, yeah. It's super weird. A picture is dipped into metal, and that is the origin of Herbie. And there's a little, like, pl- nameplate on the car now. It says it says his name is Herbie. So, and, so Buddy Hackett didn't give him his name. So they've, and they've also retconned the idea that sometimes things are just stuff. Yeah. <laughs> that was the idea of Herbie, is that sometimes you see like a, a an animate object enough or an animate object experiences enough emotional stuff that they become a person basically that's not it it's a nazi plan <laughs> it was a, a, a german like a, a technical nazi plot <laughs> yeah and in or... fact john Hanna catches wind of this process and says well if it can be happen if it can if we can do it once we can do it again yes. this is now science but instead of putting in a picture of a loved one someone he cares about he puts a picture of himself well someone he cares about <laughs> yeah and so he ends up with an evil Herbie yeah. named Horace the Hate Bug. Horace the Hate Bug. It's a black Volkswagen Beetle with little angry eyes. And again, it's getting weird. Mm. And here's where it gets weirdest. When Horace kills Herbie? Horace murders <laughs> Herbie. In the they, street. <laughs> okay, they do the scene. They do the scene from the original movie where Bruce Campbell doesn't believe that Herbie is real. Herbie yeah. runs away. And the, our, our hero is trying to find Herbie. Where'd he go? I feel so bad. But instead of like catching up to Herbie and Fun, reconciling... Catch, like, catching him from suicide. <laughs> Dana Gould... Comedian Dana Gould, who, who, who's playing the villain sidekick in I this think, one. I think he has two lines in this movie. He has, he has a few. He's, not, okay. he's, he's a small role, but he has more than a few yeah. lines. Um, but, but the, the murder the murder is a reaction shot of Dana Gould. Yeah, so it and it's, out, it's the greatest moment in this film, actually. It, I actually was genuinely disturbed by this moment. I actually don't like this moment. It actually okay. messed me up. Because it's bizarre, oh. but like it's super weird. So Herbie is like cowering, like all nervous and, jing- and jangling mm. in an alleyway, and Dana Gould just says, "Sick him, Horace!" Mm. And then you hear Herbie beeping, like in pain, and you hear <laughs> no, like, all these crunching no. noises. And then Bruce Campbell finds Herbie in pieces, dented, ruined, dead. Murdered. And Bruce Campbell is like on top of him, going, "No!" And then there's like a cut to a commercial break, mm. and then it cuts to Herbie's funeral, and they put him in a <laughs> they're coffin, and they're going to bury him. <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> well, uh, the moment I was talking about was not the murder itself, which is you know, just absurd. It's absurd, but it's they, a car they, they killing play it out like it's pain. Herbie the, was a cartoon character before you could cut we half see, and put it back together. We see a lot this of death. We see a lot of the, that murder from Dana Gould's perspective, and there's this one really long reaction shot of Dana Gould just acting as well as he can, like trying to, like he's wincing and like ooh, whipping his, ooh, ah, ooh, ooh, ah, that's ooh. gonna hurt. I would love to talk to Dana Gould about that <laughs> moment. Like, what are you imagining in that moment? What are you witnessing? <laughs> can we watch yeah, that on a loop? Just you going, ooh, ah, yeah, but <laughs> Herbie's dead. Yeah. They bury him. Who should come to his funeral? But Dean Jones. Yeah, playing his original character like the original from the Herbie movies. So we're in continuity. Yeah. Dean Jones says that Herbie can be fixed. He's just a car. You can rebuild a car. We just have to use his original part, which is a new wrinkle, but whatever. So Mm -hmm. they actually have to go to Mickey Dolan's... (laughs) <laughs> Yay! The monkeys who owns, who makes his own weird prop cars. At one point, he's driving around a car that looks like a shark. It's super weird. Well, come on, they, they had the monkey mobile. So I know. I'm just saying it's funny. He, he has a history. I'm just saying it's funny. Right. And so they have to do this whole bit where they rebuild Herbie, and then John Hanna finds out that Herbie has been rebuilt because Horace is angry all of a sudden. <laughs> Horace can sense Herbie's return. I sense love in the world. And so he challenges Bruce Campbell to a race between Horace and Herbie, and the winner gets both cars. Mm. I don't know why Bruce Campbell says yes to this. There's no, also, there's nothing at stake. John Hanna has no claim on Herbie. Well, and, like, and, and what is he going to do with Horace? Like yeah. he has no plan. It's like, and if we get Horace, we can turn him into another love bug. No, there's nothing. They have no plan for Horace. It's this weird. There's this bit in like Scott Pilgrim, and I'm trying to remember if it's only in the comics or if it's in the movie as well, where like they're challenged, like, oh yeah, you have to come meet us in this alleyway at midnight to have our big fight. No. And then at one point, Ramona just says, "Why are we letting people we don't like tell us what to do? We don't have to go do that." Let's uh, just not <laughs> and it's a great point like in this moment there's really nothing at stake if they don't do it Duh. it's not like they'll lose the car they own herbie outright it's fine <laughs> but they do it anyway mm. there's a big uh, there's a big chase it's relatively small by herbie standards because it's a tv movie well, but, but john the, Hanna- the low budget is all over this one it's shot like a tv movie it's shot on cheap sets yeah uh, the, the lighting is just even and plain and bland yeah. 
Uh, and even Bruce Campbell, like, I don't feel like his heart is in this one. I don't feel like his heart is in it, but he doesn't phone it in either. Like, he's uh, perfectly charming. He's everything the movie needs him to be. He's uh, got a really good chemistry with, what's her name here? Alexandra Wentworth, uh, uh, who plays his love interest. Um, and also, she has a lot of great speeches about, like, it gets a little meta about, oh, is this the scene? Is this the moment? Is this the moment where I tell you to, 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 to buck up and, like, be the man, be the hero? Well, I'm not that girlfriend mm. right? she's good at that stuff yeah. she sells it really well <laughs> um but they get they they there's a whole bit john hannah has supercharged horace with grenades and lasers which <laughs> chop like derby in half and then at the end they do the same ending where herbie is uh he's chopped in half vertically this time rather than horizontally mm. but like herbie comes in first and third in the race which i think should make it a tie but whatever <laughs> and so they win and horace the hate bug freaks out he tries to kill them all, ends up driving off a dam, driving through the ground, and there's like this huge explosion, like it went straight to hell. I, I think that was the implication, was that <laughs> Horace drove into hell. Super weird. I would love to see a, a like a sequel in like 2018, like in the present day, where <laughs> Horace. It, it opens with like the ground opens up and just flames <laughs> spew out, and you see this like ashen shell of a Volkswagen Beetle kind of drive out. Herbie returned eight years later in the 2005 feature film released mm. in theaters, Herbie Fully Loaded, starring Lindsay Lohan. Mm. It was directed by Angela Robinson, who's a filmmaker I think is really neat. She's behind The L Word. Uh, uh, she, and... she did The L Word. Uh, she did uh, that uh, that uh, I... that spy comedy Debs. I didn't see Debs. She also so... wrote and directed Professor Marston and the Wonder Women, which was a very bold... Uh, uh, sometimes they handle the foreshadowing kind of awkwardly, but a very, very good drama came out last year, which was about uh, the polyamorous mm. uh, relationship between the people who created Wonder Woman. Yeah. And boy, is that an interesting movie. It's really, really well acted, and people should check that uh, out. But she also directed Herbie the, uh, Fully Loaded. There's no sapphic romance in Herbie Fully Loaded. Nope. Not, not, a, not at all. It's rated G. It's rated G, and <laughs> it was, it's super rated G. It's written by Tom Lennon and Ben Garant. Uh, co-written by him. Co- they also, co-written also by written by Alfred Goff and Miles Miller, yeah. who did uh, Smallville. But Tom Lennon and Ben Garant are from the state, and they, they have written a rather amusing book about how to write this kind of cheap, meaningless Hollywood film for a lot of money. Yeah. Because they also um, did stuff like Taxi and A Night at the Museum. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's, it's called Writing Movies for Fun and Profit, How We Made a Billion although, Dollars although at the, the Box Office and You Can Too. The, the the phrase fun and is X'd off on the, <laughs> the yeah. cover of the book. It's basically how to write sellout screenplays. And they're very mm-hmm. open about it. Yeah. People need to write A Night at the Museum, which they wrote. Somebody, like, yeah, somebody, somebody has to, to write it. that. Why not I know us? How, we know how to do it and we did. And right. they also do stuff for themselves and that stuff is really, really great. But mm-hmm. they managed to find mm-hmm. this niche for themselves and they're very um, honest about it. This is 2005. This was probably maybe the very height. It, this was the crest of Lindsay Lohan. Uh, she was yeah. she was in Mean Girls. She was in uh, Confessions of a Teenage Drama Queen. She was in the remake of The Parent Trap. She, uh, I think, she was 18, so I think she had just... Uh, she had just done Mean lib- Girls the year before as and, well. And so she had also time. just uh, liberated herself from her, her horrible parents. Mm-hmm. Like, she... Uh, was an emancipated minor. Yeah. Uh, uh, she And she's great. She uh, When she was f- young and energetic and full of promise, you know, people, you can understand why people were always, were on the Lindsay Lohan train. Yeah. This is like before her personal life started to sort of eat into like, her, her film popularity. Like all of her early so, movies were really, really charming, very uh, well made. And then after she left Disney, she made a couple of interesting choices. She did a Prairie Home Companion, Robert mm-hmm. Altman movie. But then like she just had this not good movies like Just My Luck or Georgia Rule I Know Who Killed Me which won the Razzies which I actually I think has some defensible bits I think it's an interesting film but like it just her career just could not find purchase she couldn't find the right well, and, roles and, and she also outside of her movies became kind of tabloid fodder yeah. a lot, she was in like the National Enquirer she got drunk again here she yeah. made, is she on cocaine it's like everybody starts talking about her bad habits more it's, than they're talking about her career and that hurts her career and it's cruel frankly it, it what, was, we, what we do to young celebrities it, it's was, cruel. It was incredibly cruel and, yeah. and I think I think it damaged her in a lot of ways like yeah. you know an that's what it, that's what it about appears how, like from the outside how, how hard it was for her to you know get work because of how mean we were treating poor Lindsay Lohan yeah. you look back in 2005 you see it all it's all all of her life and all of her energy is there um they had to digitally alter her body for this movie well they didn't have to well Disney they, they chose did to. but yeah they, they decided they, that she they was, shrank her figure for the film they decided like, she was, she was too curvaceous uh-huh. so they decided yeah 
It's so bizarre. It's so just it's gross. Just film her. It's, it's gross. Fine. She's yeah. fine, and she's really good in this movie. She's really good in this movie. Yeah. She she plays a seventeen year old who uh, whose dad lives in a or works in a junkyard. Uh, dad works in a junkyard, but he's also uh, was a was used to be a racer. And he, also, and he used to be now racer. retired. Her older brother, played by Brecken Meyer, is being groomed to be the next racer in the family, mm-hmm. even though he's not that good at it. She was good at it, but she was in a car accident, and he she's promised not to race anymore. Uh-huh. Uh, for her graduation present, she's going to go to college in a couple of months uh, her dad played by Michael Keaton <laughs> at kind of a low point for Michael Keaton's career but he's yeah, good in this yeah. uh, he decides to get her a car but they can't afford much so they get a junk car mm. and uh, Herbie is like sees her and he's desperately trying because like the guy who owns the junk car hates him and he's going to destroy Herbie so Herbie's <laughs> desperately trying to get her to notice him and he honks and then she goes she, see, he hon- she honks Mm. Herbie honks. She sees Herbie. She goes, "Oh my God! It's so good! It's such a good thing that that car's horn is broken. Or I never would have noticed this cute Nissan right next to it." <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and she's uh, she's a bit of a gearhead, so she knows how to like fix the car and, and yeah. you know put her hands. She, in she ends up with Herbie, uh, oh, and, and it has a little note in the glove box written by who knows? Uh, I don't know where that. It says, "Take care of Herbie." I assume it's Dean Jones. Do you think it's Dean Jones? I bet it's probably supposed to be Dean Jones. Okay. But like, because it, it does seem mm. to be canonical. Because there's this whole montage where they show scenes from earlier films about how Herbie was a famous car. There's a scene where Her- Herbie dated Knight Rider or something. Her- Herbie, well, uh, Herbie. <laughs> I'm not sure how that works. Herbie hung out with Kit uh, and went to Studio 54. Which means that which means that Knight Rider and Herbie are canonical. <laughs> no, they they exist in the same universe. But again, the whole premise is Herbie is super famous and no one knows who Herbie is. Yeah. Even when Herbie ends up joining NASCAR with Lindsay Lohan, no one says and incidentally that car is a famous car remember when it won like at monte carlo that's like a 30 thing. years ago yeah that's a thing that's a famous car. michael keaton should at least recognize it or something what the <laughs> hell or at least have a moment of recognition and go the car looks familiar yeah it's probably nothing like something wait, wait a volkswagen Beetle with 53 where have i seen that before so yeah strange um she ends up herbie proves that he's he's real to Lindsay lohan and she ends up accidentally challenging a racer who's never been defeated, played by Matt Dillon, mm. uh, to a, a race around like the neighborhood at like some like local mm. carnival where he was doing an appearance, you know, hawking his various video games and other endeavors. And she kicks his ass. <laughs> she ends up like using Herbie like a skateboard and like riding Herbie along railings so she can like yeah, drift past him. Which he learned by watching her. Yeah. He, he, she's a skateboarder, and he learned how to they, skateboard by they watching. They thought her, it so, out. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, is that she promised she wouldn't race anymore, and she was wearing like a dark helmet. Mm. So she pretends that someone else was racing Herbie. Mm. A plot which kind of goes nowhere. I don't think you really needed any of that, but whatever. Um, and she ends up racing with Herbie, competing against Matt Dillon. That's kind of the whole movie. Mm. Um, there's one cool bit where Matt Dillon wins Herbie like in a race. Because uh, Lindsay Lohan like hurt Herbie's feelings and he wasn't feeling it, <laughs> and Matt Dillon just tells his hey, sidekick, "Don't, don't to call get... your car stupid; it'll re- it'll respond negatively." Matt Dillon has his sidekick get rid of it, and his sidekick takes Herbie to a demolition derby, and Lindsay Lohan has to has to Res- drive Herbie rescue around Herbie yeah. from a demolition derby. That's a full that whole bit is fun actually. The whole bit is fun, and yeah. uh, Herbie has roll top; he's got a, a, a convertible roof. Yeah, and I like the conceit that Herbie is able to roll over onto his roof. Over someone and is able to like sort of pick them up in his sunroof and roll yeah. forward and to rescue. That's a cool. That's a cool bit. action bit. My biggest problem with Herbie Fully Loaded, which is actually perfectly charming as a kids movie, like yeah. I got nothing against it particularly. I think they made one big mistake with it. They over animated Herbie by a lot. Uh, I I understand why they did. They needed mm. Herbie to be a lot more appealing, a lot more fast paced for kids who are used to a lot more movement. In, yeah. in their films. Like a lot of the early so, Love Bug movies, when they would cut to Herbie, it was literally a still shot. It's just of a Herbie. still shot. It yeah, could, it, could be a still photograph. Yeah. And uh and they've played with it to various degrees. So his Herbie, headlights would animate a little bit, yeah. or like his his aerial would he like d- press a button sometimes, he doesn't, but pretty he d- minor. He doesn't like he has like uh blinking eyes in this one, like blinking headlights. Yeah. But he only like blinks them once, like just to let us know that he's awake. But they articulate them a fine. lot. They articulate them a lot, his eyes uh, his Bumper sort of curves up and down to sort of indicate that it's a mouth. But there's like a couple of scenes where like Matt Dillon is trying to inspect Herbie, and when Matt Dillon's back is turned, mm. Herbie like expands like a weird <laughs> balloon, and it's creepy to look at. Like it's not right. Like it's mm. not. 
they pushed it too far. I realize the rules of Herbie are vague. <laughs> and I, I'm fine with them being vague, but there's got to become a time where, like, yeah. you just pull the rubber band so far that it snaps. And I think yeah. Herbie Fully Loaded just pushes it too far sometimes, and it really would have been better to scale back on that heavy animation. Yeah. If you're going to do that... I don't yeah. mind him being CG when he's racing. I don't give a shit. But, like, when he's a character, he should be... A car. Yeah. He yeah. shouldn't just be a cartoon character. Or he should he's go like, like... He's not the, he he's not start, the taxi from Who Framed Roger Rabbit. He's a car. He should start, like, kind of screaming, Ar, 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 and, like, the body starts shrinking, and his wheels turn into hands, and it stands <laughs> up, and it's Turbo Team! No, it's like, not oh, Turbo no, Team! I, I was stuck as a Volkswagen Beetle for decades! Thank God! Oh, no, I'm changing again! <laughs> Look up Turbo Team! If you have no <laughs> idea what we're talking about, one of the weirdest cartoon shows ever made. About a, a wear Corvette. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That was it. He turned into a, a teenager. He turned into a Corvette, and his friends would drive him. Yeah, it was weird. <laughs> and, he, and he could talk to them as and a the, car. The transformation sequence is really creepy. Also, like it doesn't work. Yeah, but I like Herbie Fully Loaded. I think this movie. I don't remember anyone saying anything terribly negative about it. It mm. was a. It was a. It was a time when a lot of people were really down on Lindsay Lohan just because she was famous and overexposed. Yeah. But like, it's not her fault. Like the movie, yeah, she's she, good in this movie. Everyone's mm. good in this movie. I like it. Um, I like the, I like the scene where Herbie, a 1968 model car, meets the new Beetle because in 2005 they had been introduced. Yeah. Of course, the the I I would I would love to hear what Herbie thought of the new redesign because <laughs> I remember a lot of people were really down on the redesign. It came out in like 98, well, 99 he ends, or something. He ends up dating that car? Well, no, he he ends up like kind of flirting with the car, but then Lindsay Lohan says she's too young for you. But it Herbie. ends. You know what I mean? It ends because that Beetle is actually uh, owned by Chelsea Handler. He's right. friends with Michael Keaton's character, and the, and the one of the last scenes in the movie is Michael Keaton saying, "Like, because Lindsay Lohan ends up in a relationship with Justin Long. Hmm. That's fine; they're both charming characters. <laughs> but like, it ends with like Michael Keaton talking off camera. It's like, you know, okay, you guys be careful with her. I don't want you to get in any handsy or anything. We, you know, all that that dad speech. Yeah. But it turns out he's talking to Herbie and the other Volkswagen. <laughs> I think you might have forgotten that bit. But yeah, that's 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 a thing. You don't want your cars canoodling. It's a weird, weird bit. Herbie's a weird character uh-huh. in a weird franchise. And honestly, you know, again, some of the earlier films suffer from being a product of their time, and a lot of things that happened in their time were kind of shitty. Mm. Uh, but they're mostly very charming, likable movies. Like, the only one I would say don't go out of your way to see is Herbie Goes Herbie Bananas. Goes bananas so. Like, it's just, it's not particularly well, and, good. And you have to go out of your way to find the 97 version. It's kind of hard to track down. You but, can find it online if you know where to look. Okay, but, like, it's well, it's available out there. Well, you have a VHS. We, we watched it on VHS. Like, the official Disney VHS. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's a cute little film. Mm. Um, and they're they're all... Fun, and I think uh, I thank everybody for picking I'm, a nice, lovable, likable something, something that's kind of sweet. Um, the for a franchise rest the, review. The um, the idea to move forward here, of course, there it's been announced that Herbie's going to have another TV series. That's the plan. That's I haven't heard plan, anything about it in a long time. But yeah, and uh, that Herbie was going to talk in this one, which is a mistake. Again, you can pull him too far. He stops mm. being Herbie after a yeah. while. At that point, he's just speed if, buggy. If you're going to make Herbie talk, you have to put him in the Cars universe. I think there should be like Disney has already co-opted cars in the planes movies. They could do on a cars film on their own. I think uh, they could do a Herbie, the love bug about just talking cars. And Herbie is, you know, takes the lightning McQueen. Role. I think I'd rather see that as like a TV special than something super canonical for mm. me. I, I think what I would like to see, I uh, think it's actually be a good idea. If you really want to do like a big Herbie thing, I think you just bring Herbie back. Just people still like the car. Mm. Do it. He's never done a cross country race. Do Cannonball <laughs> Run with Herbie? Oh, there you go. And then, like, maybe incorporate some of the other forgotten Disney characters. Like, the absent minded professor has his flubber oh, no. car, and yeah. Airbud is driving a car as and well. You get the no mobile yeah. there. <laughs> something there i think that'd be kind of funny but like you could herbie is gonna be is gonna return mm. if that tv series doesn't take off it might not a lot of shows don't get past the pilot phase uh he'll come back in a movie eventually it's only a matter of time again we have to wait to see what volkswagen thinks of all of this because volkswagen probably owns partial stake in herbie the but everyone time. loves herbie herbie's never done anything wrong herbie is a <laughs> likable character herbie is herbie is great publicity for volkswagen mm. So, and after a while, like, it's like the third film onward, they were open about calling him a Volkswagen. They were able yeah, to say Volkswagen yeah. a lot. So, yeah, I, I think they should go for it. I like Herbie a lot. His movies are mixed bags for the most part. Uh, I think the first one's the best. I think the first uh, one's definitely the best. I think the TV movie, even though it gets weirdly dark, is very charming despite its low budget. Uh, Herbie Fully Loaded is perfectly pleasant for its time. <laughs> perfectly uh, pleasant in every way. Yeah. Uh, uh, and Herbie Rides Again has some great moments wrapped around kind of a stupid story. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, Herbie Goes to Monte Carlo, it's all right. And uh, yeah, the, the Herbie Goes to Bananas, there's a couple of good bits, mm-hmm. but it's not very good. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's it. I, I agree on all, all accounts there. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, we, we don't have any time for letters right now. I think you got to go, right? I do have to go. You have to go. So we're going to wrap this up, uh, but we'll be back next week with reviews of new films. New films. We're going to be reviewing uh, Death Wish. And uh, Red Sparrow, mm. the new spy thriller starring Jennifer Lawrence. Uh, and we're also going to uh, uh, be reviewing a new film of your choice. And since it is Oscars weekend, and we can't really talk about the Oscars themselves because they won't have been given out by the time we record, we're going to do something for our new poll. All of the, all of the uh, movies you can choose to force us to review in the coming week uh-huh. are winners of the Razzie Award for Worst Picture. <laughs> Razzies always come out the same weekend as the Oscars. Which Rather not, shameless. Not always terrible, but mostly terrible. They're usually pretty bad. Yeah. They're usually pretty bad. There's a few Razzie Award winner winning worst pictures that I thought, like, those are pretty good movies. Ta- but, like, <laughs> mostly they suck. That is true. Mm. They're just usually obvious targets. So your choices. And we didn't want to avoid most of the super obvious ones. Yeah. Like, Wild Wild West was too obvious. Twilight was too obvious. Here are your options. There is the Bruce Willis sex thriller Color of Night. <laughs> Hooray! There's Ghosts Can't Do It, a sexy comedy co-starring Donald Trump as himself. <laughs> not a cameo. He has a character. He's not in it a lot, but by God, he's in it. Uh-huh. We we just talked about Lindsay Lohan, so we felt the need to put it in here. I know who killed me. A sort of contemporary slasher giallo starring Lindsay Lohan. It's a strange film. Who switches personalities mysteriously Super overnight strange film. after spending the night in a ditch. Uh, the Lonely Lady, uh, which is weirdly topical. And mm. uh, The Love Guru, starring Michael Myers as The Love Guru. Who, who wants to be Deepak Chopra. Okay. And All Justin those sound Timberlake just is in it. Uh, if you want to email us, uh, and we will read more emails next weekend when Whitney... Whitney is actually going out of town, so we're yeah. really, really strapped for time right now. Uh... If you want to email us, our email is criticallyacclaimedfans at gmail.com. We might read your email on the air. Feel free to ask us questions, ask us for recommendations, correct us if we got something wrong. Let us know. We'll, we'll do the best we can. Mm. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at William Bibiani. Whitney is at Whitney Seibold. At Whitney Seibold. Uh, I have an upcoming match on the movie trivia Schmodown with hey, Drew hey. McQueenie. Uh, so be sure to check that out. It's my triumphant return uh-huh. to the Schmodown. Uh, and I'm sure everything will go great. Because mm. it always does. <laughs> I am slowly being driven insane by how inconsistent my Schmodown career is. <laughs> it's pretty brutal. So I'm looking forward to the match. Uh, it's going to be a tough one. I think, and we'll they're, s- I think they're doing it on purpose. I'm sure they are. Um, anyway... So we'll have that, uh, and uh, yeah, there's a whole much more. So, am I forgetting something? I, I oh, guess. don't forget, uh, cancel too soon or other right. podcast. We have a Herbie tie-in, but we'll talk about the Herbie television series, all five episodes of that, which came out in 1982. Um, so I think that's everything. I think that's everything. All right, thanks every- for listening. Thank you, everybody, for listening, uh, and uh, never forget, everyone is a critic. I wanna go to the midnight show. I'm sorry, what? <laughs>